the 21st session of the Senate and the second regular session of the 18th Congress is hereby called to order. <laughs> Senator Cynthia Villar will lead the chamber in prayer. Okay. Let's bow down our heads in prayer. The month of October each year is dedicated to the most holy rosary, primarily because today, October 7, marks the liturgical feast of Our Lady of the Rosary. It seems fitting to pray Pope Francis' prayer when he entrusted the whole world to Mary, health of the sick, for protection from COVID-19 pandemic. So let us put ourselves in the presence of God and pray. O Mary, you shine continuously on our journey as a sign of salvation and hope. We entrust ourselves to you, health of the sick. At the foot of the cross, you participated in Jesus' pain with steadfast faith. You, salvation of the people, know that we need. We are certain that you will provide so that as you did at the Cana of Galilee. Joy and feasting might return after this moment of trial. Help us, Mother of Divine Love, to conform ourselves to the Father's will and to do what Jesus tells us. He who took our suffering upon himself and bore our sorrows to bring us through the cross to the joy of the resurrection. We seek refuge under your protection, O Holy Mother of God. Do not despise our pleas, we who are put to the test, and deliver us from every danger, O glorious and blessed Virgin. Amen. 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 The Secretary will please call the roll. Roll call of members, the Honorable Senators, Angara, Binay, Present. Cayetano, De Lima, De La Rosa, Drilon. Present. Gatalian. <laughs> Go. Present. Pardon. Presente, señorita. Ontiveros. Present. Daxon. Lapid. Marcos. Present. Pacquiao. Present. Pangilinan. Present. Pintel the third. Po. Present. Recto. Sevilla. Present. Tolentino. Villanueva. Present. Villar. Present. Zubiri. Present. Senate President Soto the third. Is present. <clears throat> With seven senators physically present and 13 senators virtually present, a total of 20, the chair declares the presence of a quorum. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, our distinguished colleague from Cavite would like to avail of the privilege hour. I had asked him earlier, Mr. President, if it had anything to do with the Lakers and Heat game today, but uh, apparently not, Mr. President. All right. <laughs> Mr. President, uh, may yes. recognize the distinguished gentleman, Francis Paul Tolentino. Senator Francis Tolentino, yes. uh, gentleman from Cavite, is recognized. Mr. President, magandang hapon po. Na wala pong kinalaman nito sa <laughs> Lakers and hit games. It, it has something to do with our response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Mr. President. I rise today, Mr. President, on a matter of urgent and paramount importance involving the worldwide efforts to develop a safe, effective, life-saving, and accessible vaccine against COVID-19 and our country's role in it. As defined by the World Health Organization, 
Clinical trials are a type of research that studies new tests and treatments and evaluates their effects on human health outcomes. Normally, clinical trials have four phases. Phase one. Phase one studies usually test new drugs for the first time in a small group of people to evaluate a safe dosage and identify side effects. Phase one, Mr. President, would involve less than 100 healthy, healthy participants. Phase two studies test treatments that have been found to be safe in phase one, but now need a larger group of human subjects to monitor for any adverse effects. Phase two, Mr. President, can involve sick COVID-19 patients and would involve more than 100 participants. Phase three studies, Mr. President, are conducted on a larger population and in different regions and countries, and, the, and then is, that's the step right there before a new treatment is approved. Phase three would involve thousands of participants, Mr. President. Phase four. Phase four studies take place after a country approval, and there is a need for further testing, usually three, four, or five years, Mr. President. This is not the case, however, for the World Health Organization Solidarity Trial and other independent clinical trials specifically conducted for the development of COVID-19 vaccine. The WHO solidarity trial will effectively reduce the time needed for randomized clinical trials by 80%. In other jurisdictions, specifically in the United States, they have what we call emergency use authorization. Kahit po paigsian pa nila ng two months, Mr. President. In the Philippines, we are part of the race against time involving an unprecedented global effort to find a treatment against COVID-19. As regards the procurement and acquisition of new vaccine vaccines, the Philippines joined the COVID-19 vaccine, vaccines global access facility known as COVAX, as COVAX. Gavi, a partner of the Bill and, Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, is likewise a leading COVAX partner. This global effort will allow the Philippines to get rapid access to newly developed COVID-19 vaccines. Ito lang po ang pinagtataho ko, Mr. President. The Department of Science and Technology recently announced that clinical trials for at least six candidate vaccines against COVID-19 could start in the country this month as part of the WHO-led solidarity trial. According to the DOST, with the following... According to the DOST, the Philippines has already entered into six confidential data agreements, CDA, confidential data agreements with the following institutions and pharmaceutical companies. Number one, Ademun of Taiwan. Number two, Sikir, Sikiros of Australia. Number three, Russia's Gamaleya Institute. Number four, China Sinovac, China Sinopharm, Sinopharm and Anhui Zifei. The DOST has allocated 89.1 million for the conduct of WHO solidarity trial in the Philippines. Hindi po natin narinig yung tinatawag na avigan na meron na rin po ngayon. I'm showing uh, this on the screen, Mr. President. This should be a good news for our people. It gives us a glimmer of hope to see the end of this gruesome pandemic, which has claimed the precious lives of 5,000 865 Filipinos and a total of 1.04 million around the world as of yesterday wreaked havoc on our economy and brought untold suffering to our people. The DOST announcement means that we are one step closer to developing an effective vaccine against COVID-19. I fully support the heroic, and, uh, the heroic efforts of the scientific community to find a cure to bring an end to this pandemic. Dati-rati po, ang naririnig lang natin, huwag naman po sila masaktan sa DOST ay yung paggamit ng virgin coconut oil at ng lagundi. If you do this right, this will be a great victory for this generation and will help secure the health, safety, prosperity of generations to come. This is why we have to ensure that we are equipped to take on this challenge. Filipinos, our lives are on the line. We have to do it right. During the budget, Senate Budget Committee hearing, Last 29 September 2020, DOST Secretary Fortunato de la Peña confirmed 
that the Philippines has already signed CDAs on COVID-19 vaccines involving at least five countries. However, when asked about reports that there are alleged COVID-19 vaccines already being distributed in the country at this time and whether this underwent the proper licensing procedure, he denied any knowledge of this. To quote the good secretary, and I, I quote, Ang unang makakaalam dapat niyan ay FDA kung merong pumasok na na bakuna dito sa Pilipinas, unquote. Mr. President, this statement is alarming and this statement is outrightly confusing. The, this begs the question, who is in charge of the clinical trials on COVID-19 treatments in the country? According to DOST, it is the WHO Solidarity Trials to the Data and Safety Management Safety Monitoring Committee is the one in charge. As of May 22, the IATF already approved recommendations of the DOST on the participation of the Philippines in the independent clinical trials for COVID-19 vaccines. On the other hand, the Department of Health announced that it has entered into an agreement with the University of the Philippines for the conduct of clinical trials for Japan's anti-flu drug Avigan as a treatment for COVID-19 patients. It appears, Mr. President, that the DOST and the DOH are performing similar, if not overlapping roles, in forging agreements with COVID-19 treatment developers. E maliwanag po sa batas, Mr. President, na ang in-charge po dito dapat ay Department of Health, maging sa kanilang implementing rules and regulations, kasama po ang Food and Drug Authority. Nowhere in the law, nowhere in their IRRs can we, can we find any reference to the Department of Science and Technology. Nowhere in the law, nowhere in the IRR can we find any authority granted to the Department of Health wherein they can outsource and let another agency perform their functions. Moreover, where do the duties, responsibilities, and accountabilities of DOST, the DOH, and the FDA begin and end? And the Republic Act, now Republic Act number 3720, otherwise known as the Food and Drugs, Devices, and Cosmetic Act, as amended by Executive Order 175 and RA 9711, or the Food and Drug Administration Act of 2009, the state is directed to ensure the safety, efficacy, and quality of drug supply to protect the health of the people. With respect to the, the registration of vaccines, the DOH has issued Administrative Order 2020-044, which establishes an accelerated review process for pre-qualified pharmaceutical products and vaccines through the adoption of the WHO Collaborative Registration Procedure. This allows the FDA to accelerate the registration of WHO pre-qualified pharmaceutical products and vaccines. This is DOH as the DOH Administrative Order issued last 22 September 2020. However, with all due respect to the FDA OIC Director Eric Domingo, whom I wrote, it's, I'm flashing on the screen, two letters of inquiries last month, he expressly denied the claims that the FDA has approved the applications for any COVID-19 vaccine being, being developed for clinical trial purposes, Mr. President. If the FDA OIC director himself seems reluctant to tell us some particulars about these vaccines, we have to wonder why the DOH and the DOST are announcing the conduct of clinical trials as early as this week, Mr. President. Government agencies involved in the conduct of these clinical trials must be clear and transparent to inspire public confidence on the safety and effectivity of these clinical trials. Mahalaga po, Mr. President, na maging transparent sila. I, 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 for one, Mr. President, I can, I can state that clinical trials are big events in other jurisdictions. In fact, they have to be announced, even the phase one of the clinical trials, because it even affects the fluctuations of the New York Stock Exchange, most especially if it involves the stocks and shares of pharmaceutical companies. For the whole country to heal as one and recover as one, we must act as one. We are still waiting for, for the roadmap 
coming from the Department of Health, a clear plan on how to coordinate and conduct the clinical trials. It seems that what we have so far is coming from the IATF Management of Emerging and Infectious Diseases Resolution Number 65, issued on August 20, 2020, which merely outlines the roles of agencies in the conduct of clinical trials. The IATF Vaccine Expert Panel is supposed to receive all preliminary applications for clinical trials to be reviewed by the designated ethics board. The applications will then be submitted to the FDA for review and approval. While, there, while this is a good start, we are still far from clear having a coherent policy on the conduct of these clinical trials. In other jurisdictions, Mr. President, there is such a concept as guinea pigging, humans being converted as guinea pigs for purposes of arriving at a correct vaccine, especially prisoners or persons deprived of liberty. As the chair of the Senate Committee on Local Governments, I also want to make sure that we prepare our LGUs adequately. Pursuant to IATF Resolution 68, trial sites will be at the barangay level and randomization will be by households. I therefore call upon the DILG to formulate as soon as possible policies that will ensure close coordination among LGUs at all levels in the conduct of all clinical trials. We should craft a clear communication plan so that our governors, mayors, and barangay captains will understand their roles and what they will do. More, most importantly, we should ensure the welfare of our fellow Filipinos who will be participating in these trials. The IATF has put in place general guidelines on safeguards against any untoward effects on participants. I recall, Mr. President, that during the hearing, the last PhilHealth hearing, I asked pointedly Secretary Duque kung ano po yung gagawin nila. Ang sagot po sa akin, magbibigay daw po sila at sisiguraduhin nilang merong insurance policy yung mga magpa-participate sa trial. We, we are still awaiting to find out the demographics of those participating in the trials, whether they will include such vulnerable groups as infants, children, pregnant women, and the elderly, and the possible risk to them and the persons they come in contact with. Above all, we have to, be sec we have to secure the informed, knowledgeable, and an un vitiated consent from all participants. Dapat po pumirma lahat yung participants kung sila ay magsasali sa clinical trial. We must ensure that we avoid the unnecessary and irreversible injuries to our fellow Filipinos who will, who will participate in these trials. We must see to it as a, as a nation, we are not merely exploited for experimental purposes. Most importantly, we must assure that our contribution to these trials will bring us tangible and positive benefits. Mr. President, I, I call again the DOH and probably the DOST and F, FDA to ensure that regulations, their own IRRs and systems are in place prior to the commencement of clinical trials. I cannot emphasize this enough, Mr. President, clinical ev evaluation of vaccines is a serious matter which should be supported by a, sol by a solid and clear roadmap, especially considering the risk to life and limbs of our countrymen. We must ensure the strict implementa implementation for the responsible, humane, and successful implementation of these clinical trials. I am confident that we all share the common desire to end this pandemic. May God bless our country. Mr. President, I will not be, uh, subject, be subjected to interpolations because I, I, I believe that the CREATE bill uh, is of high priority, but I pose this question as a moment of self-interpolation, uh, uh, Mr. President. Perhaps if I will be asked by my colleagues, I, the, my, I, I, I hope our colleagues will be asking four questions centering on the following four points, which I will not answer because I will be uh, interpolating myself. Kung meron pong, uh, ano po, what is the basis of the DOST's participation? Is it really the DOST or is it the Department of Health? Is it by virtue of the IRR or is it because it was delegated to them by the Department of Health? Number two, what is the purpose of the CDA? The CDA is the Confidential 
agreement, I meant the confidential data agreement. Kung pumirma po ba tayo ang DOH or DOST sa CDA, ang ibig sabihin po ba nito? Pakatapos po ng approval ng vaccine, ay doon na lang po sa kanila bibili ng vaccine? Are we bound because of that prior signature to purchase the vaccines from the five uh, manufacturers I mentioned a while ago? Because Mr. President, if you look at uh, current medical bulletins, I think the number one in the race right now is either Moderna or Johnson's and Johnson's or even Astra or Pfizer. But nowhere can we find any data that the OST or the OH signed a CDA agreement with the, with the said companies. Number three, number three, Mr. President, did they secure the informed consent of the participants? And number four, the issue of human rights on human guinea pigging. I pose those questions uh, to self-interpolate myself, but I will not be giving an answer. Maraming salamat, Mr. President. Mr. President, Mr. President, who's Senator Pia? Mr. Pia. President. Maybe Senator Pia Caetano, ladies first, Mr. President, yeah, and just, afterwards, just Senator Joel. Just a manifestation. Joel. Yes, and, and uh, always, uh, everybody, all, all the senators know the priorities are the ones on the floor. Senator Pia Caetano. Yeah. Mr. President, uh, the good senator from uh, Tagaytay and Cavite mentioned that he will not uh, entertain interpolations because uh, this representation uh, will be continuing with create. But it's an important topic, Mr. President. I'm very reasonable. If he would like to take, let's say, 30 minutes, I'm more than fine. I will review because the one interpolating me is no less than the minority floor leader. So I can just review here quietly. Siguro less than an hour naman para naman masalang tayo ng maaga-aga. I leave it up to you, Mr. Pre I mean, I'm not in a hurry. I just want to get it done. So if we have business to do, maybe first order of business. But subject to the um, privileged speech, I don't mind. It's, it's a very good topic. Thank you. I believe Senator Joel... Senator like Joel Villanueva has recognized. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'm not uh, uh, really set to uh, interpolate and ask questions, Mr. President, but uh, let me just uh, point out a um, uh, few things, Mr. President. One, we uh, express full support to our uh, distinguished colleague from uh, Cavite, and we are in agreement that there must be a clear plan on the conduct of uh, clinical trials. Both DOST and DOH, Mr. President, are both part of uh, IATF and must have coherent standards on the uh, conduct of uh, clinical trials amidst the rising uh, cases of COVID-19 in the country. Um, I remember um, presiding the uh, budget hearing, budget briefing of the Department of uh, Science and Technology. Unfortunately, uh, uh, I will also confirm the statements made by Senator uh, uh, Tolentino about the answer regarding uh, the basis uh, of uh, DOSP in, uh, in uh, taking over this uh, particular issue, considering that uh, DOH is supposed to be the one uh, in charge. Mr. President, I also wanted to point out uh, that uh, NEDA made its assumptions by considering uh, that the, their projection is that by the second or third quarter of 2021, the Philippines will already have a vaccine. That's why I wanted to also know if... Uh, uh, NEDA is also made aware of uh, the DOH of the progress of this independent uh, COVID-19 vaccine trials in the country. So I hope and uh, let me commit to my good uh, colleague from Cavite that before we tackle the budget of DOST, we will make sure that we have all these uh, answers uh, that he raised. And so I would, I would just end my manifestation there and again uh, support our uh, colleague from Cavite uh, of his uh, call and uh, uh, looking for answers to all this, uh, especially the three important questions that we raised. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. All right, um, Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move to refer the speech of the gentleman from Cavite to this Committee on Health. I so move. Any objection? 
Hearing none, the privileged speech is um, hereby referred to the Committee on Health. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, with the permission of Senator Pia, um, if we can just do a uh, sponsorship of one one measure, as she mentioned earlier, to give her a bit of time so her staff can be can prepare. Uh, Mr. President, with the permission of the body, I move to transfer from the calendar of ordinary business to special order, Senate Bill number 1844. Move. May we um, um, may we request for the uh, um, reference of business? Reference of business first. Oh, well, uh, it's not included. Has it been included? I thought it was included last week. My, my, my apologies then, Mr. President. I wasn't told. I thought it was already referred yesterday. So, Mr. President, I move that we proceed with the reference of business. Mr. President. All right. Um, the okay. Secretary will proceed with the reference of business. Reference of business, messages from the House of Representatives. Letter from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that on Tuesday, October 2020, it passed the following House bills in which it requests the concurrence of the Senate. House number 7688, entitled An Act Establishing a Multispecies Marine Hatchery in Barangay Mabayo, Municipality of Morong, Province of Bataan, and appropriating funds, therefore. Referred to the Committees on Agriculture and Finance. House number 7704, an act establishing a crab hatchery, the municipality of Kumalarang, province of Zamboanga del Sur, and appropriating funds, therefore. Referred to the committees on agriculture and finance. House number 7689, an act declaring the northern Antique protected seascape and landscape located in the municipality mm. of Municipalities for Libertad, Pandan, Sebaste, Kulasi, and Tibiao in the province of Antique and ecotourism zone to encourage the responsible and sustainable use and the preservation and conservation of the natural resources therein and appropriating funds, therefore. Refer to committees on tourism and uh, environment and finance. House number 7690, NAC declaring the immediate environs of the National Shrine of Padre Pio, commonly known as Padre Pio Shrine, located in Barangay San Pedro, City of Santo Tomas, Province of Batangas, a tourism destination and appropriating funds, therefore. Referred to the committees on tourism and finance. House number 7694, NAC declaring the Polillo Group of Islands and the Municipality of Mauban in the Province of Quezon, a tourism zone and appropriating funds, therefore. To the committees on tourism and finance. House number 7696. 96, an act declaring the province of Camarines Norte a tourism destination and the surfing capital of Bicol region and appropriating funds, therefore. To the committees on tourism and finance. House number 7702, an act declaring the province of Camarines Sur as the wakeboarding capital of the Philippines. To the committees on tourism and finance. And House Bill number 7695, entitled an act establishing a provincial office of the Commission on Higher Education in the province of Bohol and appropriating funds, therefore. To the committees on higher education and finance. Letter from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that on 2 October 2020, designated representatives Kanama, Ong, Jr., and Guya as conferees to the Bicameral Conference Committee on the disagreeing provisions of House Number 5422 entitled an act declaring the month of October of every year as the National Cooperative Month in the entire country, and Senate Number 1807 entitled an act declaring the month of October of every year as the National Cooperative Month. The Committee on Rules. Bill on first reading, Senate number 1872, entitled An Act Exempting Educational Appliances, Gadgets, Computers, and E-Books from Value-Added Tax for the Principal Use of Teachers and Students in Online and Distant Learning, amending for the purpose Section 1091 of the National Internal Revenue Code of 1997, as amended, introduced by Senator De Lima. To the Committee on Ways and Means. Resolution, PS Resolution number 535, entitled Resolution Urging the President and Congress of the Philippines to terminate all present efforts to sell properties in the Republic of the, of the Republic of the Philippines in Japan and preserve the same as legacy for future Filipinos, introduced by Senator De Lima. To the Committee on Foreign Relations. Communication. Letter from the Executive Secretary of the Office of the President, respectfully transmitting to the Senate the first report of the President to the Joint Congressional Oversight Committee and the Commission Audit pursuant to Section 14 of Republic Act No. 11494, otherwise known as the Bayanian to recover as one act. To the Committee on Finance. Committee report. Committee report mm -hmm. number 129, submitted jointly by the Committees on Culture, Co Cultural Communities and Basic Education, Arts and Culture, and PS Resolution number 34, introduced by Senator Dilima, entitled Resolution Directing the Proper Senate Committee Conducting Inquiry in Aid of Legislation and the Reported Closure of 55 Lumad Schools for Indigenous Children in the Davao Region, with any view of crafting legislation to protect the children's right to education as well as their rights as Indigenous Peoples pursuant to the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples and RA number 8371, otherwise known as the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act of 1997, 
NPS Resolution Number 41, introduced by Senator B. Nye, entitled Resolution Directing the Appropriate Senate Committees to Conduct an Inquiry in Aid of Legislation on the Government's Long Term Plan of Action on the Displaced Students of the 55 Schools for Indigenous Children temporarily suspended by the Department of Education with the end in view of enacting legislative measures addressing the plight of displaced students, recommending the adoption of the recommendations and their immediate implementation. Sponsor, Senator Marcos. To the calendar for ordinary business. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, for the purpose of the body, we'd just like to put on record the receipt of our bicameral conference committee report to be ratified Mr. President, it's the bicameral conference committee report on the disagreeing provisions of Senate Bill Number 1807 and House Bill Number 5422. This is a National Cooperative Month. Uh, Mr. President, with the permission of the body, uh, to hasten the proceedings, uh, being the sponsor of the measure, uh, let the joint uh, let the text of the joint explanation just be inserted into the records of the chamber, Mr. President, for the record. All right, it shall be inserted. Thank you. It's a simple paper by account. Mm. We just. Uh, uh, followed your directive, Mr. President, to remove all the IRR provisions para mobilis yung implementation at simple lang ang patas. Um, with that, Mr. President, I move that we approve and ratify the bicameral conference committee report on the discrete provisions of Senate Bill Number 1807 and House Bill Number 5422. I so move. Any objection? <clears throat> there being none. The bicameral conference committee report on the disagreeing provisions of Senate Bill 1807 in House Bill 5422 is hereby adopted and ratified. Thank you very much, Mr. President. President, if we are ready for the additional reference of business, I'm in general. It's uh yes, we're uh, we're almost ready in five seconds. Yes, Mr. President. Fresh off the printer. I think it's ready, Mr. President. I move for the additional reference of this. Mm. Good. The Secretary will proceed with the additional reference of business. Additional reference of business resolution, PS resolution number. 536 entitled Resolution Directing the Appropriate Senate Committee to Conduct an Inquiry in Aid of Legislation on the Need to Improve the Rice Importation Procedure Based on the Allegations that Certain Big Rice Traders, Importers, and Unscrupulous Industry Players are Using the Licenses of Farmer Cooperatives and Irrigators Associations to Import Rice and Taking Advantage of the Co-ops Tax Exemption Privileges to Defraud the Government in its Tariff Collection and the Rice Farmers who are the beneficiaries of these revenues under the rice tarification law introduced by Senator Villar? Referred to the committees on agriculture and ways and means. Yeah. Committee report. Committee report number 130 submitted jointly by the Committees on Civil Service, Government Reorganization, and Professional Regulation upon the recommendation of the Subcommittee on Ease of Doing Business and Trade and Commerce and Entrepreneurship on Senate number 1844, introduced by Senators Soto III, Recto, Zubiri, Trilon, and Laxon, entitled An Act Authorizing the President to Expedite the Processing and Issuance of National and Local Permits, Licenses, and Certifications, recommending its approval with amendments, sponsor Senator Zubiri. With the calendar for ordinary business. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I move that we transfer from the calendar of ordinary business to special order, Senate Bill Number 1844. Any objection? Eating none. Transferred. Mr. President, I move that we consider Senate Bill Number 1844 and ask the Secretary to read the title of the measure. Any objection? Eating none. Consideration is in order. The Secretary will read the title of the measure. Senate number 1844, an act authorizing the President to expedite the processing and issuance of national and local permits, licenses, and certifications. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, may I be recognized to sponsor the measure, Mr. President, together with several other co sponsors later? The um, Majority Leader, yes. Thank you, Mr. President. 
the co-sponsor, Mr. President. Mayor oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, Majority Thank Leader, sorry, sorry. Mr. President, I stand here today <clears throat> to sponsor Senate Bill Number 1844, an act authorizing the President mm. to expedite the processing and issuance of national and local permits, licenses, and certifications in times of national emergency. I thank my principal co-authors, specifically Senator uh, Vicente Soto III, our Senate President, Senate President Pro Temp Ralph Recto, our distinguished colleague from Cavite, Senator Panfilo Ping Lacson, and our distinguished minority floor leader, Senator Franklin M. Drillon, for shaping this measure and making sure it is responsive to the needs of the country amid this crisis. As the sponsor and author of the Ease of Doing Business and Efficiency Government Service Delivery Act of 2018, it pains me to see how the bureaucratic red tape continues to persist, even now, in the middle of this pandemic. It seems that some of our bureaucrats remain undeterred by the EODB law, or the Ease of Doing Business law, choosing instead to stick to their old slow ways, despite the very urgent needs of our people during this crisis. The president himself has expressed frustration over this persistent, the persistence of government red tape, which has hampered even the most crucial of COVID-19 response, <clears throat> such as the delivery of the much needed medical supplies and goods and the construction of infrastructure, such as communication towers and the like, which have become highly necessary for the country as millions have moved to a work from home setup and as classes move online as well. This week, we will see how our schools will fare with this new setup. And I hope it goes well, but I also feel or fear rather that the internet connections will pose a great, great problem for many students and households. Bayanian 2 address, addresses this problem in particular as we have provided some temporary powers to the president, allowing him to suspend requirements to secure permits, clearances and licenses for the construction of telecommunication and internet infrastructure and streamlining of regulatory processes and procedures for the development and improvement of digital, internet, and satellite technology infrastructure under Section 4, subparagraph double H, item 8 of the law. We even expanded this waiver of permits, licenses, and clearances to cover infrastructure flagship projects for a period of one year from the effectivity of Bayanian 2 under Section 4, subparagraph triple M. This new measure, Senate Bill Number 1844, is made under the same principle as that of Bayanian 2 provisions, only expanding the president's authority beyond this current pandemic or state of national emergency, as the measure will also apply to any national emergency we might face in the future. This measure will also grant powers beyond telecommunication. This is important. As industries begin the road to recovery, Mr. President, we will need to streamline and expedite the processes for insur issu issuance, rather, of local and national permits, licenses, and certifications to help us all to help us all transition as painlessly as possible into our new normal, Mr. President. We have also included a provision reiterating the president's authority to suspend or remove adding government officials or employees as provided under the proposed measure, which is truly, which is really, Mr. President, under his powers. In, under the Constitution. We echo the President's frustration over the continued red tape and corruption in the country. And with this provision, we will be able to put an end to that, hopefully, Mr. President, once and for all. With that, Mr. President, I hope our colleagues can support this urgent measure. Maraming maraming salamat po. And Mr. President, to co-sponsor the measure is the Chairman of the Mother Committee, no other than Senator Ramon Bong Revilla, Jr. Senator Bong Rivilla is recognized to co-sponsor the measure. Thank you, Mr. President. As the chairperson of the Committee on Civil Service, Government Reorganization, and Professional Regulation, I am rendering my full support as a co-sponsor and co-author uh, co of Senate Bill Number 1844 under Committee Report Number 130, entitled "An Act Authorizing the President." to expedite the processing and issuance of national and local permits, licenses, and certifications in times of national emergency. Republic Act Number 11032, or 
the Ease of Doing Business and Efficient Government Service Delivery Act of 2018, which amended Republic Act Number no. 9485, or the Anti-Red Tape Act of 2007, provides for simplified requirements and procedures that will not only ensure efficient turnaround of the delivery of government services, but more importantly, prevent graft and corruption. Admittedly, there is so much more that needs to be done to achieve our goals, but certainly we are getting there. While we are on this track, the COVID-19 pandemic came and gave us many realizations. One of these realizations is that circumstances and priorities are extraordinary in times of national emergency, thus needing swift but judicious actions from our leaders and from all of us. Ginoong Pangulo, sa panahon ng national emergency, maraming aspeto ng ating lipunan at ekonomiya ang nangangailangan ng agarang pagtugon. For example, the procurement and transport of uh, necessary goods and services, the establishment of, of new business and industries as well as the continuance of the existing, existing ones that will keep the economy thriving and the construction of, of needed infrastructure to strengthen our systems. All of these are vital to our government's actions for response and recovery. Ngunit nagiging balaki dito, ngunit nagiging balaki dito ang maraming papeles na kailangan tulad ng permits, licenses, at, and uh, certifications. Uh, in our response to the national emergency brought about by COVID-19 pandemic, we granted temporary rel relief and suspension on various permits and clearances, especially those for essential industries such as telecommunications under Bayanihan 1 and 2 laws. However, these, these laws are time-bound. If the pandemic will continue beyond the deadlines that, that were identified under, under the laws, kailangan po natin uling magpasa ng batas upang tumugon dito. Gayun din, kung magkakaroon ng national emergency dahil sa ibang kadahilanan, hindi na, hindi na din natin magagamit ang mga batas na ito. Apart from that, the Bayanihan laws were reactionary me measures that we are endeavored to pass under, uh, under time pressure. Ginawa po natin ang mga batas na ito nang tayo inaatake ng mga kalaban na hindi natin nakikita. Madalian po natin ginawa ang batas na ito dahil sa kontribusyon at pagkakaisa ng lahat ng miyembro ng ating kapulungan. Naging maganda at makabuluhan ang maipasa natin ang batas sa kabila ng maikling panahon na hawak natin. To better prepare our country and our people, we need a proactive and holistic approach to address any forthcoming circumstance that will entail an, a national emergency. Sa pamamagitan po nito, hindi lamang natin maiiwasan ang mas matinding pinsala, kundi mas madali din tayong makakabangon mula dito. Mr. President, this is what Senate Bill Number no. 184462 to achieve. Ang panukalang batas na ito ay naglalayong magbigay ng pahintulot sa Pangulo ng ating bansa na gawin ang tatlong bagay. First, to accelerate and streamline regulatory processes and procedures for new and pending applications for and renewals of permits, uh, permits uh, licenses, clearances, certifications, or authorizations. Second, to suspend or waive the requirements in securing such documents. And third, to prescribe to make uh, permanent the said streamlined regulatory processes and procedures and the suspension or waiver of the requirements is securing said documents. Meanwhile, the, the bill provides a proactive cloak to the environment by exempting the existing procedures and, and processes that protect the environment, the protected areas and its buffer zones and environmental critical areas from the coverage of the exercise of the said granted authority. Accordingly, I believe that this piece of legislation will help our country to be in a better stance for any challenge that may come. Isa itong instrumento ng pagiging handa ng pamahalaan 
Malaking tulong ito upang hindi mag, uh, maghikahos, bagkus madaling makabangon ang ating ekonomiya at hindi malugmo sa kahirapan ang ating mga kababayan sa panahon na kinalalagyan natin ngayon. Before I end, Mr. President, I would like to commend our, our Majority Leader, our Subcommittee Chairperson, Senator Mick Subiri, for his steadfast and zealous advocacy uh, for this measure. I will, call, uh, I will call on our colleagues to support this passage of the same. Of the same. Thank you, Mr. President. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Next to co-sponsor the measure is a distinguished Colleague from Davao, Senator Christopher Bongo. Senator Bongo is recognized to sponsor the measure. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. It's my honor to co sponsor Senate Bill 1844 under Committee Report 130. Isa po ito sa pinakiusap ni Pangulong Duterte kay Senate President Vicente Soto na tulungan siya sa kampanya laban sa. Corruption. President Duterte was clear he has uh, built this uh, uh, administration on a strict uh, anti-corruption stand. We have to take uh, radical steps to uh, cut uh, corruption and simplify the requirements and steps in doing business in our country. We have to fix the bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic problem, not just to improve ease of doing business, but also to curb uh, corruption. This is especially uh, important in times as our economy recovers from the results of the pandemic. Red tape and corruption have been uh, perennial problems and the president is uh, exasperated. In fact, he has even shown willingness uh, to speak before the Congress on how deep the corruption and red tape uh, problems run. Indeed, the president has been uh, hard at work, but he and the rest of the government continues to work. Never would they allow those who paint the government uh, in a bad light uh, to win. Katulad po ng sinabi ng Pangulo sa kanyang uh, pakipag-usap sa publiko nung nakaraang lunes, why would they take, for example, one month when it can be done in one week or even uh, three days? During his time of, as mayor of Davao City, three days lang talaga, if it takes uh, more than three days, mayor requires an explanation in writing why it took more than three days or else he will file the retro as ombudsman. At alam mismo ng mga negosyante yan, yung mga pinapatulog uh, para sa amin ni Pangulo, uh, this is plain and simple negligence po on the part of the government worker. Merong tinatago at merong inaantay. And mismo po si Senator Cynthia Villar alam niya dahil nagnegosyo po yung pamilya nila sa Davao. Ayaw na ayaw ni Pangulong Duterte na pinapatagal. At parati niyang pinagbibilin pag uh, merong mga negosyanteng uh, nag-offer po ng mga uh, suhol. Ang parating pinagbibilin ni Mayor Duterte, huwag niyong tulungan. Pero pag uh, walang binibigay, tulungan niyo turuan nyo lang kung anong dapat nilang gawin at sumunod lang po sa proseso. Sabi po ng ating Pangulo, we have two years to make things faster. We want to see things moving. Tagal, matagal na pong problema ng ito. Kung hindi pa isasabi uh, ang Pangulo, hindi pa rin ito mabibigyan ng pansin. In fact, sabi po ni Secretary Anyo, nung lunes, bumilis na po ang pag-approve ng mga LGUs ng permits and licenses tumaas ang number of approved applications. This is good. I hope this is start of a real change in how we deliver uh, public services. Pero sana hindi na kailangang i-remind pa trabaho natin yan. Gumalaw na tayo bago pa tayo sabihan. Now to those who continue with their ill practices, mahiya naman kayo, maliit na bagay, pinapatulog ninyong papel, I'm telling you, talagang yayariin po kayo. Alam ko, marami pa ang uh, namamayag pag uh, dyan sa BIR, sa, sa customs. May araw din kayo. Uh, sa mga, sa BID, uh, yung kahapon po, merong hearing sa Pastillas, uh, by chairperson uh, uh, Riz Santiveros, 
uh, marami pong uh, nababanggit doon na talagang uh, corrupt. Uh, sabi ng Pangulo, pili lang kayo. You resign or lumayas na lang kayo or kung handa naman kayong kainin yung pastillas na mismong perang ninakaw ninyo ang uh, palaman. So pili lang kayo sa tatlo. Resign, layas, o kainin niyo yung pastillas na pera ang laman. Sa mga kawatan sa gobyerno, bantay mo mga yawa mo. To those who continue to serve with integrity and diligence, the people, the Filipino people, thank you for your service. Do not fear because you are doing the right thing. To my fellow Filipinos, I encourage you to join the fight against corruption and red tape and help towards having a clean and efficient bureaucracy that provides the kind of service which we all deserve. Where you see wrongdoing, report it. Where you see opportunistic public officials file complaints, point them out to us and we will see uh, that uh, they are held uh, accountable. Together, let us demand what is due to us to those who have sworn to render public service with integrity and efficiency. Know your rights and demand the best because you deserve nothing less. We have to help each other. I am happy that we continue to push for measures which uh, will improve the delivery of public service and make it more convenient for the people to ask for and receive services. Hindi lang po itong ease of doing business, but also other measures such as uh, my own proposed bill, ito po yung e-governance, it, it will guide the country in harnessing the power of information and communications technology to change the way the government works with the people and the business sector. I hope that in time, support rin po natin ito. In consideration of these uh, sentiments, uh, Mr. President, I manifest my intent to be a co-author of this measure, and I urge that this chamber to support its uh, immediate passage. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, 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 Senator Bongo is made the co-author of the measure. And uh, just as a caveat uh, to the, doon sa mga korap sa gobyerno, wait for this bill. Majority Leader. Mr. President, uh, raising his hand. Uh, we have in the list also Senator Bato de la Rosa, but he's willing to give way to our Pambansang Kamao, Mr. President. Senator Manny Pacquiao is raising his hand as well. The champ is recognized, Senator Manny Pacquiao. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I would like to commend and uh, congratulate our uh, Senate President, uh, Senator Vicente uh, Soto III, and Senate Pro Tempore, uh, Senator Ralph Recto, Majority Leader, uh, Senator Miguel uh, Zobere, Minor Minority Leader, uh, Senator Franklin Drilon, and uh, Senator Pampilu Lacson, uh, Senator uh, Bong Rivilla Jr., and Senator uh, Bungo, uh, Senator Bato de la Rosa, uh, uh, for uh, <clears throat> um, and to all the members of the Senate, uh, uh, senators, my colleagues, uh, uh, thank you for posing this uh, measure. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, our country was uh, hit by what was hit uh, drastically. However, we remain firm in our optimism that we can rise amidst these challenges. With this, uh, let us work together in doing what we can do to support our countrymen. I would like to co-sponsor and co-author the Senate Bill 1844, an act authorizing the president to expedite the processing and insurance of national and local permits and licenses. This measure can uh, surely give a great uh, impact in supporting enterprises in our country, which are trying to rise from the pandemic. I firmly believe that as we provide uh, practicable solutions uh, such as this, we will be able to refuel our economic growth and bounce back as a nation. Thank you, Mr. President, and God bless you all. Thank you. Uh, uh, Senator Mani Bakel's um, intention is so recorded. Mr. President, we recognize also a distinguished gentleman from Davao del Sur, Senator Ronald Bato de la Rosa. Senator R. Ronald De La Rosa is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon, Mr. President and distinguished colleagues. I want to start with a quote from Albert Einstein. 
Bureaucracy is the death of all sound work. Mr. President, I stand before this body to co-sponsor Senate Bill Number 1844 under Committee Report Number 130. This is an apt and timely measure that could improve the bureaucratic processes of our country, improve the delivery of service, and lessen the burden of our Kababayans in dealing with the government during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. The proposed measure seeks to give power to the president in times of national emergency to hasten and streamline government regula regulatory processes, as well as suspend or waive the requirements in securing permits, licenses, clearances, certifications, or authorizations. Mr. President, the complexity of bureaucratic process breeds extensive bribery and corruption. The elimination of corruption remains the chief priority of the Duterte administration. President Duterte has always been adamant in his stance against corrupt government officials and employees. There is a relentless effort of the administration to put up the significant mechanisms in order to end corruption in the government, from the national government down to the local government units. The passage of the Anti-Red Tape Act of 2007 and the Ease of Doing Business Act of 2018 are some of the remarkable attempts of the state to end bureaucratic red tape and thwart graft and corruption in all facets of government. In line with this, President Duterte issued Executive Order Number 43, which created the Presidential Anti-Corruption Commission to assess the president in investigation and handling of administrative cases involving cases of graft and corruption against presidential appointees. We are living in difficult times, and I join the frustration of President Duterte. Corruption still plagues the country, and we must not stop fighting it. Wag na sana nating hayaan na pumila pa ng matagal ang ating mga kababayan para makakuha at makumplito ang napakaraming mga requirements upang makaramdaman ang servisyo ng gobyerno. Gawin natin simple at mabilis ang mga proseso, Mr. President. Mr. President and my dear colleagues, let us complement the efforts of this administration in the efficient delivery of government services and the fight against corruption. Let us all support the passage of this legislative measure. Maraming salamat po. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> before you suspend consideration of the measure, Majority Leader, let us give credit where credit is due. Uh, indeed, uh, Senator Bongo was correct. The President was asking uh, and asked me for help uh, in a meeting in order to um, be able for government to be able to address the issue of corruption. That was when we uh, had a small meeting between some of the leaders, uh, the President Pro Tem, Senator Larson, the Majority Leader, and uh, the Minority Leader. Uh, the, this idea of 1844 was the brainchild of Senator Frank Rilod. And um, I just want to place that on record. Give credit where credit is due. Majority I Leader? I completely agree, Mr. President. As a matter of fact, the good senator from Iloilo wanted to keep it simple. Instead of uh, mm. reviewing the ease of doing business, instead of reviewing yes. each and every permit and licenses given to each and every agency, he suggested to keep it simple and uh, give the powers to the president on what he wants to do in terms of streamlining and cutting the processing time of these measures. And to reiterate, to reiterate the power of the president to remove heading officials under his watch. Senator Pia Caetano is uh, taking the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. president. I was actually just going to be asked to make to be made a co-sponsor. I was not there in that meeting, obviously, but uh, my brother told us about it, how important it was for the president, exactly as you said, uh, Mr. Senate President. So um, I would be honored to be able to be a co-sponsor. Thank you. All right. We place that on record also. Mr. President, we do recognize uh, Senator uh, Grace by her voice, but if she's not ready, we could have uh, Senator... Uh, Joel Villanueva, after which Senator Richard Gordon. 
Senator uh, Joel Villanueva, and then thereafter, Senator uh, Richard Gordon. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Majority Floor Leader. This is just to uh, uh, put on record my uh, sincerest uh, support to this uh, particular measure. Um, we are one of the blessed members of Congress who passed uh, Anti-Red Tape Act, the original Anti-Red Tape Act, together with Senator uh, then Senator Laxon, and uh, we just want to uh, make sure that we are also part of history in uh, uh, passing uh, this measure, this very important measure, uh, within, with, with, with the permission of the uh, uh, principal authors that uh, uh, myself be made a co-author, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Senator Richard Gordon, recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, Dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon. I am in support of this measure on the outset. However, I do have some concerns which I'll probably ask during the interpretation. Uh, I believe that uh, this has been the bane of our country. People have always complained about the slowness of our bureaucracy. You know, when I was mayor, I, I told our people, pag mabagal ang pagbabayad ninyo, ibig sabihin, naghihintay kayo, bigyan kayo. And that is precisely what this bill addresses. There are many, many uh, permits being requested uh, from local governments to national government entities. And there seems to be a slowdown whenever the permit is going to be given, whether it's in the Energy Regulatory Board, whether it's in the Land Transportation Commission, whether in, it's in public services. That has always been a problem. Now, Mr. President, I come from Subic Bay. And uh, when we authored the Subic Bay Law, I say I authored it because we are the, were the ones who presented the whole copy of the bill to the Congress at the time. We always thought that speed was the name of the game. We cannot get anybody to invest in our country if, we'll take, if it will take ages before their permits are obtained. Even, for example, when we got FedEx, we had to have long discussions but then when people realized that it was going to go to the benefit of the country, when we become a hub or for logistics, then, you know, Mr. President, during this time and during this age, and even 30 years ago when FedEx came in, speed was already the rule. You had to deliver goods and cargo overnight. Uh, and that's what the whole essence of UPS, DHL, FedEx, speed is the name of the game. Now, Mr. President, one of the big complaints uh, among many uh, uh, in our country is, number one, is the quality of corporate governance. It behooves, therefore, every president to appoint the right leaders to particular positions, Mr. President. Because kung hindi naman marunong yung mag-i-appoint, eh talagang magtatagal yan. At talagang yun ang nagpapatagal. Dahil hahanap ng paraan, kumukuha ng title para kumita. And that's what's wrong with our government today. That is kaakibat ito tinatawag natin government competence. Kumisan, uh, uh, there are so many people playing different games and the competence of the leadership is questioned because they don't really appreciate the vision that in any part of the world today, speed will always be appreciated. I've often said that the business of government is to let business pass because business knows better where it's going. And so long as uh, we are protected from environmental uh, rapacity, or for that matter, uh, taking lands from the indigenous people or taking advantage of the weak, uh, then always, if we don't protect that, then the mighty, the powerful, the influential will always have the upper hand. And that's why uh, we have this problem of the rich always getting richer and the poor always getting poorer. Uh, that's why all our bills have been to make sure that we remove the restrictions, especially in the patent laws involving land for the poor, uh, that they can get their land quickly without having to go to court. And this is already approved, thanks to the Congress. This has already been approved on three separate uh, examples of speed. And then you have policy stability and predictability. Uh, this is part and problem of this. Uh, you have to make sure 
that there is consistency, and if there is no consistency, there is delay. If there is no continuity, there will be delay. And that is why I support this measure, Mr. President. Uh, in the uh, because I've always been a, uh, an optimist. I don't believe that man is a, an evil person. Uh, uh, he's created in the image of, our, of God, but at times there will be people who will put their pockets and their uh, you know, greed ahead of the national interest. That is why when this bill is approved, I hope that whenever somebody comes in the way, then they will be punished as fast as permits are going to be granted in this uh, law, Mr. President. There will be challenges to be sure ahead. I am for the Kaliwa Dam, but there will be people who will say the Kaliwa Dam should not be approved. The Kaliwa Dam is needed to provide water for Metro Manila, especially since our dams in Bulacan are already uh, drying up or already really, really old. I could be for the nuclear plant so that we could have better power. After all, Taiwanese have about nine or 10 nuclear plants and they're our neighbors. And permits will be better secured. But then of course, when we do it, as Napoleon once said, if we must make haste, let us make haste slowly. I have full faith and confidence that the people around the president will make sure that this is moderated to a point that does not delay, but allows the government to be able to see to it that what we do will benefit the country in a very uh, fast way rather than you know uh, delaying it. I am particularly concerned, for example, about permits being given, for an example, in procurement. There are always matters that are getting in the way in procurement. That's why our military keeps getting uh, uh, inferior equipment because some of them look at the position to, uh, to uh, take advantage of the possible uh, kickbacks that occur in high ticket items. I saw the other day that we were getting a, uh, almost like a World War II plane with, uh, you know, like the Thunderbolt uh, with the shark uh, uh, fangs and teeth uh, on the uh, fuselage. I don't know whether that's good. I hope it will be useful because uh, we cannot use fast, high uh, performance jets when we go after the Abu Sayyaf or other folks uh, in the underground. And that is why let's always uh, be careful. Let's make haste slowly. Uh, and in the end, hopefully this provision will push us towards modernization because I know that the president wants modernization. He modernized Davao. I think he can modernize the Philippines as well. And uh, it's so important, therefore, that we give him the support. And I, uh, you know, uh, fall in line in so far as supporting this measure. Uh, but you will forgive me if I can ask questions later, especially on the matter of uh, what is the scope Will it include all the acts of local government? Because I know a lot of local governments delay the issuance of permits. The LTO and the LTFRB are agencies that are often accused by the drivers of delaying their licenses. Or for that matter, even the police, when they catch somebody, they take the license and they play hide and seek with the drivers to have to make ends meet. All this is part and parcel of a corruption that has grown and continues to grow to the prejudice of our people. Panauna, para ayusin ang Pangulo ito, at alam ko ang Pangulo, galit sa corruption, and I support him when it comes to really going after the corrupt, and I'm sure, I pray and hope that he will do so. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, uh, I, I, I would like to reserve my a position to co-author or sponsor it after the debates uh, have been undertaken. Thank you very much, Mr. President. All right, thank you. Uh, Santo Gordon, Majority Leader. <laughs> thank you, Mr. President. Uh, no other member wishes to... Uh, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Santo Bongo would like to be recognized. Uh, Santo Bongo is recognized. Uh, Mr. President, uh, small brother, Senator Subiri,
just want to uh, extend my uh, sincerest uh, thanks to our big brother, Senator uh, Drilon, uh, for its willingness to help uh, the administration in our uh, fight uh, against corruption. It only shows that uh, we are one against uh, corruption. Thank you, Mr. President. All right. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank and just you. to remind, it's uh, to remind everyone, it's a, a multi-party across the house, both. Uh, uh, minority and majority assisting this measure, so showing our yes. sheer support. Yes, Mr. Mr. Majority Leader, this, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President. Mr. President, be recognized, Senator Grillon. Senator Grillon is recognized. Yes, I just want to spread it to the record my appreciation to the Senate President and the Majority Leader for acknowledging uh, uh, our effort to craft this bill. Uh, yes, we are in the opposition, but when it comes to matters of public and national interest, we put aside our political differences with the president and would be willing to help as always. And we placed our effort, uh, we had we, we, we placed special effort to come up with this legislation, with, which we hope will help and will be passed uh, as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. President. Again, my appreciation for your acknowledgement and that of the majority leader. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also, you. Senator Delon. Yes, thank you very much, leader. our minority floor leader. Uh, leader. Mr. President, before we suspend consideration, may I make a humble request to Senator Bongo? Uh, if Senator Bongo could reach out to our uh, dear friends in Manacanang, maybe they can also ask for a, to make this a priority measure. So that if we pass this on second reading next week, Mr. President, uh, if uh, the Office of the President can certify it, we can pass it on third reading as well next week. But uh, yung hiningi po ng ating Pangulo na additional powers for the ease of doing business may bigay na po natin next yes. year, Mr. President. And for the record, I sent a copy of the bill to uh, Speaker Al Gaetano and uh, Majority Leader Martin Romualdez. Thank you, Mr. President. At least on our part, uh, we were able to uh, do it and uh, finish it to third reading, Mr. President, with our colleagues all in full support. But we'll need that certification. So kung send bong, kung pwede po ninyo makausap si ES. Yes, sir. Uh, right. Mr. President, <laughs> we'll make it sure. Thank you. Mr. President, I move that we suspend consideration of the measure. Any objection? Meeting none. Consideration of the measure is suspended. Mr. President, I move that we resume consideration of um, Senate Bill number 1357 under committee report number 50. Any objection? Meeting none. Consideration of the measure is in order. May we recognize, Mr. President, our distinguished sponsor, the lady senator from Taguig, Senator. Uh, Pia Cayetano, uh, to sponsor and to interpolate a distinguished minority floor leader, Senator Franklin M. Drinon. For the continuing period of interpolation, Senator Pia Cayetano, sponsor is recognized to interpolate the minority leader, Senator Frank Drinon. <laughs> we are ready, Mr. President. Senator Drilon is on mute. Yes, uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Yes, uh, will the uh, good sponsor, the uh, the gentle, the, the center from Tagig, yield the floor to a few questions on this period of interpretation? Of course, Mr. President, we are happy to yield to the minority floor leader and to hear his comments uh, and to respond to the best of our ability to his questions. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, um, we can assure the, uh, the, the good sponsor that uh, this bill has been subjected to extensive interpolation. A lot of questions have been raised. Uh, and uh, therefore, there are just a few matters which we would like to uh, seek guidance uh, from the uh, good sponsor uh, in order that we can be guided when we uh, finally vote on the measure. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the two main features of the bill would be the lowering of the corporate income taxes and the rationalization of the fiscal incentives. As uh, Senator Recto alluded to in the, uh, in, during the, when he raised questions on this bill, the more difficult portion really is the uh, rationalization of fiscal incentive. The lowering of the corporate income taxes is, uh, is accepted by everyone as necessary. Uh, it is in the uh, rationalization of the fiscal incentives, which uh, has raised a lot of questions. Now, um, Mr. President, um, the
sponsor in uh, her sponsorship speech and in the uh, in and in response to the uh, questions during the period of interpolation, has stated that uh, the uh, the uh, rationalization uh, is uh, of fiscal incentives is uh, sought because of the, uh, uh, the because the present incentives. Uh, are not time bound. Uh, they are they are not performance based. They are not targeted, and they are not transparent. So our first question is, uh, Mr. President, um, how much in foregone revenues did our country suffer as a result of these uh, incentives granting of incentives, which uh, has been criticized? Uh, which is being reformed uh, by, by by the bill. Uh, may we know if the good sponsor can tell us the foregone revenue, say, last year in that 2019? Mr. President, the latest figures we have is 2017, and it's 441 billion. And in the previous years, they're all over 300 billion. So it averages of it averages around 300 plus billion. But as I said, the latest I have is 2017, 441 billion of foregone revenue. That's a little unfortunate because we passed the Timta law, which uh, we crafted and was passed when I was the Senate president. Are we saying that up to this point, uh, the Timta law is not being fully implemented? Because that would uh, uh, tell us the, uh, the, the data that we are looking for in 2017 is certainly uh, dated. Mr. President, as I await uh, a more official result uh, response from our resource persons, what I can what I can respond to based on my previous conversations is precisely why uh, the we want a create law passed is because the application and the approval of said application of every investor will also depend on their compliance on submitting all the data, including the IPAs. They must submit, Mr. President. Um, apparently, they have the IPAs, uh, the, the IPAs have not been submitting uh, the documents to DOF, to DTI, and therefore um, the CREATE law will require, because they're, they're being in good standing would be dependent also on their submissions. So, as I said, for now, we only have 2017. Um, for 2018, they have data, but they are still disaggregating it. They are still consolidating and analyzing. So I do not have anything to present for 2018, so, but, Mr. President. Yes, uh, okay. That, that's okay. Uh, Mr. President, may I ask the group on the right, their voice is competing with the people on the floor. So it's hard enough, I'm sure, for the minority floor leader to hear me in a mask. But um, I know, I know naman it's not, uh, just, it's not uh, intentional. Please proceed. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, but just to get a complete picture, yes, uh, 441 billion in foregone revenues in 2017, which is the only available data. But to complete the picture, uh, what? How many jobs were generated uh, by 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 these incentives granted? For 2017, Mr. President. Um, three, 143,181 jobs, Mr. President. Is that direct or including the indirect jobs? I'm assuming that's direct, no? I suspect that's only direct I'm jobs. assuming it's direct, Mr. President. Usually they would have another column. Uh, they would separate if it's indirect. So that would be direct. Yes, it's confirmed. It's direct. Okay, so, uh, but uh, usually the indirect jobs would be much, much larger than the, uh, the direct jobs. Uh, am I correct, ma'am? Yes, Mr. President, definitely. In fact, I, I, I recall asking what is that multiplier that they use if it's a standard. I just can't recall what that is, but definitely much larger, Mr. President. Yes. So, uh, from, from, the, from, from, uh, from the previous responses, uh, of the good senator, it would appear 
that these incentives are being abused uh, or are 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 uh, uh, not necessary uh, because uh, they are, for example, uh, availed of by industries which are not really critical to our development. Is that correct, ma'am? Just, in, just yes. in general. Uh, definitely what we hope to achieve is to find out exactly what what is the measure what is the contribution of every investor for whom we are giving up these revenues for so in other words um as i said 441 billion no let let's just say that's, that well it is divided by roughly 3000 um investors and for sure there would be some there that are employing thousands and thousands of employees uh there would be some that are are taking seriously the the transfer of technology that are introducing research and uh, um, higher value added then then that that obviously we would want that but there would be those who have been receiving um these uh, incentives for more than 20 years and we don't even know mr president we don't have the data that shows have they been complying have how many number of employees do they have what is the value added the favorite example of the secretary of finance is uh um, one uh, particular industry is known to be a watch, watch, no, a watch, um, uh, watch uh, factory, and yet the um, value added nothing is something like just the strap. Every other component is imported, and that's also why. I mean, this is already outside of the question of his honor, but that's also why we are enhancing the deductions if the the input is from domestic sources because we want them to be using domestic. So basically, all of this has to be tracked so that we know exactly what these companies are contributing and is it worth the the um, the foregone revenues, Mr. President. Uh, uh, thank you for that answer, ma'am. I would want to make it of record that we fully concur with the good sponsor that we there must be transparency and the contribution of every investor must be uh, made of record uh, given the fact that uh, they are these investors are favored with incentives um so it would appear that we have quite a liberal uh incentive regime uh, 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 and made worse by uh, abuses that we see along the way which is tolerated because of the uh, way we have crafted our uh, investment uh, structure. Would you agree with that, uh, uh, Mr. President? Sorry, sir. What what was that question? <laughs> um, I'm trying to recall. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> I, was uh, I, I was saying that uh, <clears throat> uh, certainly uh, the way it stands today our investment laws are quite Actually, liberal yes yes are quite liberal and in fact has resulted in, in some abuses that uh, would have to be corrected uh, would the, would yes. the gentleman yes. do that yes mr president and of course we are not saying that everyone is abusing but we are saying that we do not we apparently do not have a system in place that compels these investors to be transparent and neither does it seem to compel the ipas to also crack down on those to, to demand transparency and to crack down on those that are not delivering mr president um so given that why are our investment uh, figures foreign direct investment uh going down the uh, uh data from the philippine statistics office would show the decline in investment growth even before the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, from our data, it would appear that the foreign direct investments uh, peaked in uh, 2018, but has been declining since then. The Banco Central itself reported that the FDI's inflow sunk from 758 million in August of 2018 to 416 million in August 
2019 or uh, uh, or or uh, or 45% uh, lower. Um, and so we are wondering why, notwithstanding this liberality that uh, we see on our investment uh, structure or in our investment laws, uh, even without considering the unnecessary uh, investment uh, privileges, why is our investment uh, picture uh, not so good? Thank you for that question, Mr. President, because it will. I hope it will also help our colleagues understand the situation. Let me take his honor back a few years. I am looking at a chart, and I, I don't know, maybe if my staff can share this. Um, but in any case, um, if I have a chart that shows that the FDI uh, has been increasing more or less since 2010, and then it started taking a dip sometime after 2017, Mr. President, now, the reason for this dip is global. It is not, um, it is not uh, only the Philippines that has been experiencing a decline in FDI. Uh, this is due to the geopolitical situation, uh, US and China. So a lot, of a lot of investors have had this wait and see attitude in general. However, what is worth noting is the following. Um, PESA's investment has more or less been on a continuous decline before starting just before 2012. It basically looks like this, going down a little bit of up, but not really recovering and then all the way down. So while FDI was going up, PESA was going like this. What does that tell us? Well, foreign direct investment until 2017 continued to pour in the Philippines. So if his honor and I agree that um, there were, we, we still have much to do in terms of improving our investment environment. Apparently, there are still um, investors that came in despite um, our, our um, incentive system. Uh, the conclusion there is a lot of investors will choose to invest not because of incentives alone. And that is shown in uh, World Bank, in World Economic Figures, in World Economic uh, Forum um, data, that there are many reasons why investors come into a country and incentives do not play the most important role. So I'm not downplaying it, but that is a fact that it is not the most important reasons for investors to come in. So thus, when the decline started to happen, then that was already a worldwide phenomena, not exclusive to the Philippines, Mr. President. <coughs> I'd like to point out that um, BOI um, had, starting 2010, went a little bit up, went down, up, down, but actually started to peak after 2017. So um, as, the press, as the Senate President Pro Temp pointed out, who tend to be the BOI investors? Well, a lot of them are those seeking the domestic market. They still continue to come in, Mr. President. Uh, well, and most of them would be local, Mr. President. Yes. Um, Fair uh, uh, we, oh, okay, there you are. Yes, that is it, Mr. President. Let me know if you'd like me to explain. The dot, that's the FDI, the dotted black yes. line. Yes, please. Oh. The dotted black line that you see going up continuously but just dipping at the end, that is the FDI, Foreign Direct Investment. And yes. then um, the red line is, BO, is uh, PESA, Mr. President, where it's basically a continuous decline. And then the blue line, which is a little bit rocky, was low in the in the first few years, but then started peaking around 2017. That is BOI. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Well, <clears throat> from my own research and from what we have read, it would appear that the really the decline started about the third quarter of 2018, insofar as FDIs are concerned, and the black dotted line would so indicate that starting 2018, it has, it has gone down. And I assume that will con that has continued to go down. Uh, yes, I think so. I, mean, I was just based on the graph I said around 2017, but his owner might be, is probably more accurate, no? around 2018. That's correct. And it has gone down continuously <clears throat> for the, the past, two years. Uh, 
So, okay. Uh, I guess okay, the next... So Mr. President, may I just add something? Um, but meanwhile, in the last, um, I'd say easily 18 months, 24 months, um, the economic team has been in discussions with new investors, and their statement is that they are in a wait-and-see attitude specifically for the Philippines because of CREATE. So these are targeted investors who we want to come into the Philippines, and they are awaiting the resolution of this CREATE, Mr. President. Well, uh, okay, uh, I, I can partially agree, and I emphasize partially agree on that, because uh, when you look at the FDIs in our, uh, around Southeast Asia and China, you would notice, we note that uh, um, the, uh, the companies have started to move out of China because yes. of the trade war between the United States and uh, China. Uh, in fact, Japan, a close ally of the United States, have, uh, offered uh, financial assistance and incentives to their own, to the Japanese companies, in order to relocate out of China. However, these companies have relocated to Vietnam, to Malaysia, to Thailand, but not in the Philippines. Uh, the uh, Japanese investment bank, Nomura, reported that out of 56 Japanese companies, 26 went to Vietnam, 11 went to Taiwan, eight to Thailand. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, and in Vietnam particularly, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Vietnam uh, attracted about 31 billion in U.S. imports that shifted away from China in 2019 and in 2020 as of uh, the first seven months, already 18.8 billion. So why are we being left behind in terms of attractiveness uh, as an investment destination of these uh, companies which are moving out of China? Uh, so there must be a reason other than the uh, investment loss, because our investment loss uh, appeared to be uh, attractive enough for this, uh, at, at least for these people to take a look at our 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 situation, 136. Uh, the government, from the report, says that they are trying to persuade at least 135 foreign manufacturers from China to relocate to our country, but none so far have done so. Why uh, may we know? Uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, certainly this is not because of the uh, uh, the uh, defect in our incentive laws, because uh, as the good sponsor himself said, it's more than liberal. It's liberal. Sometimes it's being, uh, it's not being transparent. Yeah. So why, why, why is it so? I'm happy to respond to that, Mr. President. Please. Just Recap. Um, despite actually having a gross income, gross earning, um, of five, oh, no. gross That's income good. earning of five percent tagged as forever, which there are some proponents in, uh, in, in where we have colleagues who want to perpetuate that, and yet why are we not able to attract these other companies that we are seeing are going to Vietnam and other neighboring countries? I have some answers, Mr. President. Uh, this is just my own um, uh, conclusions, putting together all the information that I have, I have, and the research that has been given to me. Number one, Mr. President, let's look at Vietnam. Well, for one, we know that Vietnam has really been aggressively marketing themselves. And let me um, refer to the interpolation of our colleague, uh, Senator Dick Gordon, who really emphasized the importance of marketing. Number one, Vietnam is really out there selling themselves and. What are they selling? It's not just, it's not all, all air, no? It's not just marketing. Melaman, Mr. President, yung binib yung kanilang offer. Number one, Mr. President, you can buy land in Vietnam. And we know that this is one of the um, issues that has been brought to our attention. No? We, we cannot, we do not allow foreign ownership in our country. Number two, Mr. President, the wages in, um, 
in Vietnam are very low, much, much lower compared to ours, Mr. President. And another third um, important factor is that they are strategically located uh, because of, they are strategically located as far as China is concerned. Their proximity to certain economic centers of China cannot be, cannot, we, we cannot compete with that. No? So they are close to Shenzhen. Uh, I don't know what other areas. So those are three main factors that make doing business with Vietnam or transferring to Vietnam perhaps more attractive to uh, than ours on the surface, Mr. President. But let me also add that next to Singapore, Vietnam has the most FTAs, foreign trade agreements um, with other countries. It's Singapore that has, um, that has the most, and then Vietnam is the next, and uh, we, we lag behind. So we all know how this works. You sign this agreement, and as soon as you sign it, you know, there's exchange of uh, the highest ministers, whether it's the uh, foreign minister, the trade minister, if not the prime minister, the president himself. Nakaabang na yung mga deals to sign. No? So without that, um, without that, then then we're, we're a little bit lagging behind because that, that arrangement, that relationship is already sealed by those factors. And then there are other factors, um, including uh, transportation system, um, the supply chain coordination, availability of local inputs, and so on and so forth, Mr. President. Um, but I would just like to uh, go back to marketing. Um, when we market ourselves, I know from conversations with uh, business owners, foreign business owners here, and we know it for a fact, the reason our BPOs are still thriving, still thriving, I don't know for how much longer, is our, because we dominate the world when it comes to the English language. Um, but our, our uh, non-English speaking neighbors have been working double, triple time for the last 10 years. No, Thailand has been getting our teachers. Uh, China for many years has been getting our teachers. So I mentioned that because here we are, baka kulang na nga ng konti yung marketing to say that this is one of the advantages we have. And when they come, they know, they, they love it because they can speak and communicate well. And yet, hindi buo yung ating picture. We are not focusing on that in our education system. It's a talent that we already have. And yet, um, we are not trying to boost the English language the way they are in our neighboring countries. So maybe that edge that we already have will soon disappear, Mr. President. So <clears throat> that is the lack in coordination that I also see, Mr. President. Yes, <clears throat> thank you for that uh, answer, Mr. President. And in fact, Senator Gordon added a few things like uh, uh, the uh, uh, speed. Uh, uh, speed. The, yes. yes. And then uh, the uh, infrastructures um, uh, that uh, would have the investors are looking for. So uh, having said that, Madam, uh, uh, Mr. Madam Sponsor, I ask a very uh, a question. When we try to rationalize the incentives, which apparently is not the reason why we are lagging behind, uh, are we not barking on the wrong tree? Um, it's. I will, I will answer that by saying that it is high time that we rationalize the incentives. There is no point in having a rash, uh, incentives that are not time bound at all. No, People should be accountable. Our investors should be accountable. But I must say that we should not end there. There is so much more to be done, Mr. President. Uh, yeah, I guess because... I can give a long list of, of what needs to be done. Transportation palang that needs to be yes. added to. I so agree. Me, Mr. President, Definitely. Yes. A, a, a lot. In consistency, rule of law, uh, consistency yes. of policies. So the, the reason I'm bringing this out is I do not know uh, whether, uh, I, I, I'm not yet convinced uh, at, at this point that indeed uh, the, uh, the uh, rationalization of uh, fiscal incentive at this time would uh, improve our investment climate to its uh, uh, from the way the, the the good sponsor is explaining, is really at, almost at the bottom, or not a major factor in influencing uh, investment uh, investment uh, decisions. On the other hand, 
the joint uh, foreign chamber of commerce uh, chambers of commerce uh, claims that the measure will lead to a loss of 121,000 direct jobs and 582,000 indirect jobs, or a total of about 703,000 jobs. Does this not cause concern uh, to the good sponsor? Of course it does, Mr. President, but this is the problem that we face. Um, there is only one industry, Mr. President, who was able to submit data to substantiate their claims that their industry would really be affected and that jobs would be lost. And that industry is the garment industry. All other industries, Mr. President, kept on saying this is how much. And we asked for justification. For example, Mr. President, the BPO industry. Uh, data that, that DOF and DTI, the economic team, have would show that they can recoup their investment in 18 to 24 months. And yet, of course, um, a lot of them, why will they complain or, or um, voluntarily return this incentive that we keep handing them on a silver platter and keep saying, go ahead, take it. We don't need those revenues. 441 billion that could be building schools, more targeted um, students uh, for industries that we want roads, infrastructure, warehouses, exactly the things that we lack, Mr. President. So if we don't do this now, when will we do this? It may not be on the top 10 list of what an investor is looking for, but they do look at it. That's one. I did say that. And number two, if we don't, we are bleeding. We are bleeding revenues that could otherwise be put to better use. Giving it on a silver platter to investors who we thank came into the country, but like any taxpayer should be paying tax at some point in time, Mr. President. So I go back to the general rule. You do, do business, you pay tax. What is the exception? The exception is you are coming from a particular sector or you are investing in a way that, that we want to support, that we want to encourage. And so for a limited period for specific mm -hmm. Um, um, targeted goals, we will exempt you from paying taxes. And then you start paying. So that's why we have to clean this up, Mr. President. And the time is now. No, I think um, no. An, a lot of senators who have held the chairmanship of the co this committee, um, and even those who've been here for a while, have said, ang tagal ng pending itong mga bill na to. And we have come this close. So I, I say it because I've learned, I've come to realize the importance of this measure, Mr. President. Uh, no question about the importance of this measure. Uh, uh, the urgency. President. The urgency. Certainly, certainly, we find this measure important. Well, I guess what we are just uh, putting on the record is our concern about the timing of the measure, uh, given the fact that we are going through a very difficult a period caused by COVID-19. Um, so, um, uh, the may, end, I, you, may I actually add to that, Mr. President? If you allow me to finish, ma'am, just, just yeah. so I can finish. So, the, the the that is our concern, the timing, because we have lost thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs as a result of the pandemic. The, uh, the uh, Department of Labor has reported that as of July, we have an unemployment rate of something like 10%, equivalent to about 7 million uh, jobs having been lost. And uh, and to, to have this uh, uh, rationalization today, again, there is the risk of loss of jobs. Uh, that we are facing, we cannot just uh, we cannot just uh, sweep this aside because this is a matter that we should address and consider when we go on rationalization. And our neighbors, I tell I, you know, I, 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 I you know, Vietnam uh, particularly uh, has been attracting uh, 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 investments. Uh, of course, the uh, the uh, the good sponsor mentioned a few reasons. But just, just to point out, in Vietnam, foreigners are not permitted to own land also. The same with us. Uh, and anyway, so, so that's, the, that's where we're coming from. We are concerned about the timing. I repeat, we have no objections to the rationalization. But the, we are putting this on, the re on, 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 on record 
and spreading it in the record of the of our debate because of the peculiar situation that we are in today. We are in a pandemic, 10% uh, unemployment rate, seven and a half million unemployed, and the foreign chambers have state have a made of record that they it can lose law, it can lead that this law can lead to loss of 121,000 direct jobs and 582,000 indirect jobs or almost, or, or over 700,000 jobs. That is where we're coming from, uh, Madam Chair, and I hope that that is made clear. Mr. President, um, my response was incomplete, but before I give the second part of my response, the first part, and I will reiterate, none, Mr. President, none of the industries were able to submit, whether it is in my committee hearings, which I had so many, or in the consultations that I had with them per sector and per company, none of them have been able to submit any data to substantiate that claim of the job loss compared to the garment industry. That is why we were able to carve out a, a specific provision, Mr. President, for the garment industry. And I repeat, the data we have for BPO show that in 18 to 24 months, they recover their investments. Many of them have been in the country for 10 or 20 years. They have been earning, Mr. President. So if they will submit, we, of course, it, we are duty bound. And I think her, my this representation has, has uh, proven that we read, the, we read the data, we do not ignore any data. Um, we do not claim to be an expert, but we definitely can read and can do some basic analysis. And no, nothing was ever submitted to us to substantiate that, Mr. President. That's one. The second point I failed to, um, that I wasn't able to get into, Mr. President, is that they failed to uh, recognize, because I know they know it, that there is nothing about their incentivized um, benefits that will change the minute we pass CREATE. On the first year, they will still be able to avail of it. On the second year, they will still be able to enjoy it. On the third year, they will still be able to enjoy it, Mr. President. We are simply being responsible and using futures thinking here by saying in due time, in due time, in a reasonable amount of time, you need to be accountable for the incentives we have given. Not now, during the time of COVID, not next year, and not even the next. The earliest any incumbent, in, uh, any, any current investor would receive, would be then subjected to, um, no, sorry, the earliest time that any current investor would start availing of the sunset clause that provides a slightly different rate would be after four years. And some would go up to five, seven, and nine years, Mr. President. So to say that affected sila, hindi po. In four years, walang magbabago. Sa fourth palang mag and for some seven years, and for some nine years, Mr. President. So is that not exactly what our job is about? to foresee these situations and to put that into place so that we're not scrambling when that time comes. All of this will happen post-COVID. And mm -hmm. obviously, if um, there are, are unexpected circumstances, God forbid, na tumagal pa ang COVID beyond three to four years, Congress can easily go back and fix that, Mr. President. But the point is, it is not accurate and it is unfair to say that tatamaan sila ngayon or, or in the next year or two because wala hong change in the next few years. And when tatamaan sila, there is what we call a sunset provision that mm -hmm. still provides them with a, um, how do I put it, a more gentle no uh, transition, Mr. President. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and for those uh, for that very detailed answer, it is certainly appreciated and it's good that it is of record. Uh, but from the way you have responded for the past 30 minutes to our questions, uh, you would agree with this representation that indeed the rationalization of, uh, uh, of the incentives uh, 
questions can be raised uh, in the courts of law attacking this measure for whatever reason, uh, given the, the fact that it will affect uh, uh, certain uh, investors and certain companies. Uh, that, that should uh, that should not be out of the equation. Would the, would the, would the lady agree with me on that? In other words, it can be questioned. The rationalization of fiscal incentives or the bill itself can be questioned in our courts. Well, I don't know what their basis would be. So would his honor like to be more specific or would his honor prefer yes. that I just jump in and say, are you referring to the non-impairment clause? I am referring to the bill containing more than one subject. Okay. Right? Uh, because uh, the... Uh, there are two subjects, lowering of the income of the corporate income tax and the rationalization of the fiscal incentives. Let me elaborate a bit, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. President. I'm bringing this out because I have also a proposed solution, which I hope that the uh, to, to strengthen the, the uh, compliance with the Constitution on this point, which I hope that the good lady senator can consider. Okay, so... As we said, the uh, bill contains two subjects, the uh, lowering of corporate income tax and the rationalization of fiscal incentives. The lowering of the corporate income tax is found in our National Internal Revenue Code, NIRC. Uh, on the other hand, the fiscal incentives are enumerated in various uh, uh, fiscal incentive laws, various laws, uh, including the Omnibus Investments Code, uh, or the Special Economic Zone Act, as well as other special laws to provide powers to the IPAs. So these are the two. The, these are the two laws that are are, uh, are that, that, that these are the laws that uh, would be covered by the subject. Uh, uh, the, uh, for example, Madam Chair, reading the entirety of the National Internal Revenue Code. Uh, would show that it has to do with production of taxes, with the organization of the BIR, the BIR uh, how uh, it, the BIR should uh, uh, administer the collection of taxes, etc. Uh, it has uh, uh, um, the NIRC as it is today has nothing to do with grant of incentives. The National Internal Revenue Code. Uh, it has nothing to do with the the uh, the uh, uh, bill in so far as the uh, fiscal incentive fortune is concerned. It has nothing to do with uh, uh, the uh, uh, National Internal Revenue Code. Uh, would you agree with that, uh, Madam Chair? To start with, is that a correct uh, 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 reading of the of the bill? No, Mr. President, I do not agree with his honor. Why, Madam President, Mr. President, why is, isn't it that the lowering of the corporate income tax is found in the NIRC and the fiscal incentive is found in special laws? There is nothing in the NIRC about the, about the rationalization of fiscal incentives. I am ready to respond to this, Mr. President. Yes, please. Um, please. Mr. President, um, to begin with, let me start with the concept. No, um, A bill is known to be complete when its title is comprehensive enough to embrace the bill's general objectives. The provision of a bill are germane when all the parts of the bill are related or not foreign to its general subject or title. Mr. President, in the case of Farinas versus Executive Secretary, an act having a single general subject indicated in the title may contain any number of provisions, no matter how diverse they may be. Let me repeat, no matter how diverse they may be, so long as they are not inconsistent with or foreign to the general subject and may be considered in furtherance of, subs of such subject by methods and means of carrying out the general subject. So, Mr. President, this is a Supreme Court case, and there are many Supreme Court cases that support this. In fact, for the record, we have an opinion of the Senate Legal Council, 
we have an, op an opinion from the Senate Tax Study Research Office and the Senate Parliamentary Council that all support this, Mr. President. I would be happy to read into the record more and more um, jurisprudence on this matter and relate it to how CREATE um, is, is uh, written, Mr. President, to support the fact that there is absolutely no violation of the one subject rule. Uh, we uh, Thank you, Mr. President. We can also cite numerous Supreme Court decisions which clearly uh, uh, prohibits and, uh, um, and, and, and does not favor uh, several subjects being in the same, uh, in the same bill. In the first place, uh, Mr. President, we are all aware of the constitutional provision of the constitutional uh, the, the provision on Article 6, Section 26, Paragraph 1, which says every bill passed by Congress shall embrace only one subject which shall be expressed in the title thereof. Is there anything in the title of the bill, Mr. President, that uh, uh, embraces uh, the issue, the, the uh, uh, incentives uh, regulation? It only, yes. cites, it, it, it only cites a title. Reading the bill, you wouldn't know. Reading the title. You you wouldn't uh, uh, you wouldn't know that uh, incentives are being uh, uh, regulated here. Now, also, uh, if you will allow me, uh, I, can I just you allow me, Mr. Yeah. President, uh, in the case of Philippine Judges Association versus Pete Prado, decided in 1993, it. The Supreme Court ruled that the purpose of, of this constitutional provision is to prevent hudspuds or lug rolling legislation. And lug rolling was described in the case of Lambino versus Komelec as the deliberate intermingling of issues to increase the livelihood of a measure's passage. And that's exactly what we have today in our humble opinion, uh, Mr. President. Pinagsama po yung incentives, yung rationalization of incentives with the lowering of the corporate income tax. Because correctly, if these two measures are put together, uh, the, the chances of uh, the livelihood of the measure being passed is, is higher because then you the, the uh, matter of the reduction of the corporate income tax is a welcome development. On the other hand, the reduction of the, uh, of the incentives is resisted naturally by uh, businessmen. So by putting this together, uh, according to the Supreme Court, in the case of Lambino versus Comelec, there is a deliberate, and let me quote, deliberate intermingling of issues to increase the likelihood of a measure's passage. And that is precisely why uh, having two subjects in one bill is prohibited under the Constitution. Mr. President, we note his honor's concern, and I am familiar, this representation is also familiar with that case, Mr. President. However, um, we also have sufficient jurisprudence that would justify that this subject matter can be put together under one measure, Mr. President. I quote, generally speaking, the courts are agreed that a statute may include every matter germane, referable, auxiliary, incidental, or subsidiary to, and not inconsistent with or foreign to, the general subject or object of the act. And if you look at the title, Mr. President, the title of the act is very clear an act reforming the corporate income tax and incentive system, Mr. President. So in, what I mentioned as the guidelines provided by the court in that case um, is, is, clearly, is clearly present in uh, the, the CREATE bill, Mr. President. Um, they are related. They are not inconsistent with the general subject or object of the act. So... Um, let me even take this further, Mr. President. Like I mentioned, uh, we have the legal opinions of three different um, separate, um, uh, what do I call them, departments of 
of uh, within the Senate, and the House also has their separate opinion. So this representation, I can assure my colleagues, did not take that, that issue lightly, Mr. President. Uh, we wanted to be sure that we can also defend this, and this representation is convinced that we have sufficient and more than enough jurisprudence to, to ensure that this bill can stand that question of, of the one subject issue, Mr. President. Um, I can I can mention even more and let me let me just um <clears throat> refer to some of the um some of the the Is points points emphasized in the opinions that we have. Actually, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, the Prado case that His Honor mentioned actually concluded that it is not violative of the one subject rule. So there was a discussion on what would be violative because it is the principle. These principles are used many times in many cases, but in the particular case that His Honor is citing to prove that there was a violation, in fact, the ruling was there was no violation, Mr. President. And like I said, um, the governing um, um, the rule that I, the, the jurisprudence I am also citing in the Farinas case makes it very clear that we, the, similarly, the CREATE bill um, is covered. And I would like now to go into the details no, of the CREATE bill and why it is this honors, this, this representation's humble um, opinion that uh, it is complete on its own and it will pass the test. <clears throat> So first, we look at the title, Mr. President. As I mentioned, the title is Corporate Recovery and Tax Incentive for Enterprise Act. That in itself is complete, Mr. President. The title satisfies the constitutional requirement of completeness because it is sufficient. It sufficiently informs the legislators and the public of the nature, scope, and consequences of CREATE and its operation. CREATE in no uncertain terms proclaim just one policy that is reforming in the corporate income tax and incentive system by codifying into one general law all the taxes and incentive provisions for business enterprise. The other, the other matter, Mr. President, is germaneness of the test. A statute may include any matter germane to its subject. Yes, Mr. President, uh, let me continue. In the Farinas versus Executive Secretary case, a legislation may contain any number of provisions, no matter how diverse they may be, so long as they are not inconsistent with or foreign to the general subject. And we have further um, citations on what is the germane test. Um, all provisions under CREATE relate to the reform of corporate income tax and incentive systems. System. The reduction of the corporate income tax, the rationalization of fiscal incentives, the governance of the incentive system through the FIRB, and the repeal of the provisions under the charters of the IPA are consistent with the provisions of the NIRC as amended and are not different subject matters as all pertain to the taxation in the country. Thus, the provisions bring germane, ancillary, incidental, and subsidiary to the provisions of the NIRC as amended CREATE does not violate the constitutional requirement that every bill shall embrace only one subject which shall be expressed in the title thereof. Moreover, Mr. President, in Sumulong versus Commission on Election, the constitutional requirement as now expressed in Article 6, Section 26.1 should be given a practical rather than a technical construction. It should be sufficient compliance with such requirement if the title expresses the general subject and all the provisions are germane to that subject. This is also repeated in other cases, Tobias versus Abalo, citing Lidasan versus Comelec on the liberal construction of the one subject, one title rule. I will no longer go into that in more de in, in great details. Um, like I said, um, we have we also took note of the 
opinion of the House of Representatives that quoted the same Farinas versus Executive Secretary case that we have uh, mentioned already, and that was also quoted by three different departments of the Senate. Um, I leave it at that, Mr. President, but like I said, I am happy to, to discuss this further if His Honor has further concerns on this matter. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. <clears throat> the reason why we raise this issue and is, espouse and is pushing for a strict literal interpretation of the constitutional rule on, 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 on uh, one, one uh, subject matter is the opinion that the, uh, that the good sponsor um, uh, made of record during the interpolation of uh, Senator Angara when he said that, when you said, or when the good sponsor said, Mr. President, that this is a revenue measure. It is a revenue measure principally because of the uh, corporate income tax reduction. Now, the con is that would the, would the lady confirm that, uh, Mr. President, that her view is that this is a revenue measure? Mr. President, the fact that it is a revenue measure does not prevent us from tackling any other matter that is still related um, in the title of the bill and germane to the subject matter. So I agree. We have to yes, Your Honor. I agree that uh, the courts have given this a liberal interpretation. Yes. Yes. I, agree. I, have, I am aware of these cases, but there, as I premised it, I have premised my statement. The reason why I am attributing a, a literal reading of the uh, and a strict, stricter reading or interpretation of the provision is the opinion of the uh, of the uh, good sponsor that this is a revenue measure. That's why I'm, I'm first, first I'm, I am confirming, is that the opinion of the good sponsor that this is a revenue measure? Mr. President, I, this representation did state that it is a revenue measure, but that does not mean that it cannot, that it has to be a revenue measure only because there is no violation of the one subject of one bill rule here, Mr. President. No. That response uh, was was directed at his honor's question to find out if there can be line vetoes by the executive, Mr. President. So knowing that that was the um, emphasis or the direction of the interpolator, Senator Angara, uh, that is the response that we gave. But in the context of his honor's question now, I will state that it is a revenue measure indeed, but it also includes in the incentive system, which we are rationalizing, that is very clear in its title and which is germane to the subject when you look at it. They are all related. They are not um, there. There is no intention to to deceive the public or the legislators on the subject matter. And they all are consistent with the general subject, Mr. President. Mr. President, my very serious concern is the uh powers of the president that flows from the classification of this measure as a uh, revenue measure, uh, even if it includes policy issues that would go into the, uh, the, uh, the uh, rationalization of fiscal incentives. Uh, with, if, if the good sponsor will insist that this is a revenue measure, then the president can exercise a line item veto, which to me is improper given the fact that the rationalization of fiscal incentive is not a revenue measure. It calls for policies that this, uh, that the Congress would, uh, would uh, put into the law. It has nothing to do with raising revenues per se. The revenues are raising, revenue raising is merely incidental to the main topic, which is the rationalization of the fiscal incentive. Uh, I am concerned about this measure, this, uh, this uh, uh, situation, Mr. President, because it will weaken the institution of the Senate and Congress. And I'll give you a specific example with your indulgence, uh, Madam Chair, or Madam 
Sir, Madam Senator. Suppose uh, the, 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 the bill right now, and I'll be very specific, the bill right now removes the incentives from on the tourism industry. Is that correct? No, Mr. President, that is incorrect. That is what, incorrect. What's correct? In so far as the tourism industry, the tourism industry, is, Mr. The tourism industry, Mr. Pre Mr. President, remains incentivized. It is still in the SIPP. So there is okay. no change there, Mr. President. Okay. And a lot of the a lot of um, aspects of uh, tourism would be captured. Um, I, in, I'm not even sure if it's just tier one, but probably even tier two and tier three. All right. Okay. Now, okay. Let, let's 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 have another example. Say the uh, the uh, power of the FIRB. Huh? If we amend the powers of the FIRB as a Congress, can the president exercise a line item veto? Sorry. Can you repeat the question? If we if, if we, we amend if we amend the powers of the FIRB. Can the president exercise the line item veto power? Mr. President, I actually asked that question and I'm also awaiting the, the legal opinion. But my opinion is because we do not distinguish, because we consider it a revenue measure, then it could be done. But I am also asking if there is jurisprudence or if this has been um, studied uh, in any manner, because I understand what his honor is saying and I just wanted to give an accurate uh, an accurate response what, what we're saying uh, uh mr president with all due respect is the fact that you when you classify this measure as a revenue measure then the president would have the power to uh, exercise the line item veto over a matter which is not strictly a revenue measure measure and that is the rationality the, the other provisions in the rationalization of fiscal incentives, which involves policies, if the good, uh, if if you know, we will really have problems. And I'm 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 trying to draw the answers because I am proposing a solution. Uh, if at least the good sponsor can preliminarily accept that uh, this is a possibility. If I go to if a if somebody goes to court and raises this issue, I don't think it is such a baseless proposition that it will be just dismissed outright, I think it can be forcefully argued that uh, the uh, rationalization of fiscal incentive should not be a revenue measure, and therefore uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, authority to, of the president on a line item veto should not be existing because as a consequence, if we accept that proposition, then every measure that would pass through our chamber for debate could be considered as a revenue measure with the slightest indication of a revenue uh, a race or revenue uh, aspect, even if it's only secondary. And under that theory would make the president very powerful and would weaken uh, Congress as a, an equal branch of government because any policy that we would propose can be subject of a line item veto. Um, I, I would like to hear the comment of the good sponsor on this concern that this representation has, which in, you, you know, with all due respect and in, we humbly submit, is the totally baseless, uh, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, this representation um, is of the view that it is our job to 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 explain and try to address the concerns of uh, our colleagues. So there is no problem um, on my part, Mr. President, on this representation's part, to explain to the best of our ability what what we know, what our position is on the matter. So the the minority floor leader uh, can can ask any question and can uh, interpose his. Uh, objections to this, this representation's uh, opinion and view. But to the best of our ability, we are trying to substantiate these views with jurisprudence or rulings or opinions uh, that matter to help uh, his honor get clarity and also for the sake of our uh, colleagues who would be listening. Uh, Mr. President, yeah. um, the rationalization of, of incentives 
is actually not alien to the subject matter of the corporate income tax because this is addresses tax leakages, Mr. President. And it is the reverse of increasing the tax, decreasing the tax. If his owner will recall, when um, in the early part of our interpolation when we started, uh, I, this representation emphasized the fact that this is foregone revenues, foregone revenues, and thus we need to rationalize because otherwise these are tax revenues that are being exempted. These are, these are tax revenues that are not being collected. They are being given on a silver platter. And therefore, this is very germane to the topic of revenues, Mr. President. There, there is no separation, in fact. It is not, it's not even an alien topic, Mr. President, as, um, as it may initially appear to his honor because they are covered by different codes. We have enough jurisprudence and opinions that also tell us that a bill may cover, may amend, may repeal various laws, various provisions of different laws, and it is still germane to the subject matter, Mr. President. So I hope that adds a little bit of clarity um, that when we speak of incentives, we are talking about foregone revenues, uncollected revenues because it was given um, as incentives, but they are also can also be viewed as exemptions. They are not being taxed. I said early on that the general rule is that every person engaged in business pays taxes, and yet we provide exemptions to some, maybe because they come from a vulnerable sector, or we provide exemptions by way of incentives to others who we want to attract. And therefore, Mr. President, it is not difficult for this representation to understand and to defend that it is one subject matter that is co that is um uh, that are intertwined with each other and can easily be um, justified as falling within complying with the rule on only having a, a, a one subject matter per bill, Mr. President. <coughs> well, well, uh, I guess uh, yes, uh, Mr. President. Uh, there is a uh, there is a. Uh, very uh, clear uh, disagreement uh, between the views of the good sponsor and this representation, and and uh, the precisely what we are pointing out is the effect on the powers of Congress, with the view taken that this is a revenue measure because it would authorize the executive to exercise the line item veto and uh, even if it has even if the revenue raising is merely incidental to the policy then the line item veto would precisely defeat what otherwise is a policy promulgated by congress but having said that i will propose a solution which i hope the uh, uh, the uh, good sponsor can consider uh, as we said, uh, while we have a little problem about the, uh, the, uh, the timing of the uh, uh, rationalization of the fiscal incentive, uh, we can live with that and take a second good look. But I have really problems about the power of the president to exercise his line item veto in this particular case. As we have analyzed, uh, the Department of Finance proposed these two measures to be, or these two subjects to be in one measure so that the uh, you know, Congress cannot uh, cherry pick, in other words, pass the uh, reduction of corporate income tax, but do not pass and will not, will not pass the, uh, the uh, rationalization of fiscal incentive for obvious reasons. There are lobbies, that's a reality that we have to face. Uh, would, the gen would the good sponsor uh, uh, be amenable or open to the idea of splitting the bill into two? One is the corporate income tax reduction. The other one is the rationalization of the fiscal incentive with the understanding of all the centers and the leadership that uh, we will pass first the, the uh, we will pass the two measures simultaneously but separately and uh, the corporate the corporate income the uh, rationalization will pass uh, first if you want and uh, the the corporate income tax will come after in other words we we have two bills that we act uh, simultaneous uh, simultaneous basis 
but we act, we act on them separately in order to remove the uh, power to exercise a line item veto because clearly one is uh, is not a uh, a, a, a revenue measure uh, whereas a corporate income tax reduction is indeed a revenue measure and uh, madam we, mr president we have passed a number of laws on uh, the uh, uh, fiscal incentive it was never considered as a revenue measure uh, it was a statement of uh, the, this is a fact uh, the the uh, rationalization of fiscal incentive, the omnibus investment code, the uh, the uh, amendments uh, that were passed after that were never considered as uh, as uh, revenue measures, which will subject it to a line item veto authority. I will repeat my proposal. Let us split the bill. It will not be delayed so that this constitutional uh, issue will be resolved. But more importantly, we are able to preserve the power of, the, of Congress insofar as policy making is concerned. We submit that to the good sponsor. Thank you, Mr. Sponsor. This representation is always interested in hearing the minority floor leaders' views. Uh, this representation was a uh, neophyte senator when uh, uh, the Senate president was then the minority floor leader. So, of course, I am always willing to listen to opinions and views. As I have said very candidly and honestly, I learn a lot from these interpolations. Let me just say a few things, Mr. President, before I respond directly to the question, if I am willing. Um, Mr. President, um, as I said, I candidly spoke in the beginning, um, explained in the beginning, that I view the ras rationalization of incentives really as a similar to tax exemptions. No, that's why I said there are the, the general rule, you pay taxes, and then there are those who would be exempted. So like, like I have, um, like this representation has uh, explained, that is my understanding. I personally view it in that way because it's revenues that would otherwise be collected if not for this law that um provided for exemptions by way of incentives now um i do not uh, i do not know and but i do not um contest his honor's statement that previous um laws on incentives were not considered revenue measures i do not have personal knowledge i just do not know that for a fact your honor um but the position i take is that it definitely is justified as a revenue measure. I could argue that, Your Honor. Uh, His Honor is a good lawyer, much more experienced than this representation. I'm simply saying that this is something that I could personally um, argue because I believe that it is arguably a revenue measure, especially taken in the context that it is presented now, especially given that the objective is to look at the overall uh, situation that Filipino taxpayers are in, and therefore we are decreasing all the corporate income tax and then rationalizing what are given to a select few. It makes it is come it is logical for this representation to understand. I am simply explaining where this representation is coming from in my appreciation of this measure, Mr. President. I liken it to train where I did not have, I was not in the Senate at that time, and I did not actively defend the measure when I was in the House of Representatives. But from my knowledge, um, as there were changes made in the personal income tax, uh, the levels were changed, uh, there was a cutoff of 250 and below, no tax, and so on and so forth, graduated um, income tax. And then at the same time, personal exemptions were removed. So this representation viewed it in that way, even from the start, when this task was, was uh, when, when we accepted this task to become the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means. That is how I tried to understand it. In fact, uh, in yesterday's interpolation, I also told the Senate President Pro Temp that I will listen very keenly to his um, uh, interpolation and ideas about the graduated income tax because precisely because it is being offered in uh, to a person in their personal capacity in their when they are sole proprietors 
and yet it is not being offered to them in their corporate capacity. So I am simply saying that um, trying to um, uh, lay the basis that this representation, your chair, is truly trying to understand uh, the different points of views and the issues here, but also explaining where this representation comes from in her own understanding of the uh, um, corporate income tax decrease and the rationalization of tax incentives. Um, what is really our objective here, Mr. President, is to propose a balanced return and both that are a, a, a balanced reform uh, wherein we have both, which are both essential to the policy of rationalization, Mr. President. So for now, Mr. President, I would have to say that my position is I would prefer to keep this bill intact. However, like I always say, uh, we can always discuss this in the body. I am just one. I have always said that uh, with this bill, it is, I, I do not have the liberty of defending a pet bill. This is a bill that I take on for the Senate because we all agree that there are steps that we need to take. We may disagree on the details. And so um, definitely we can, this is one of those things that we need to discuss because the position I take as chair, Mr. President, is I would prefer to keep it intact, Mr. President, for the reasons that, that I have already put on record. Yes, uh, thank you for that, uh, Mr. President. Thank you for the good sponsor. Uh, yes, uh, this is not the first time that uh, I uh, experienced, uh, you know, an honest disagreement uh, between uh, two senators. Uh, uh, that disagreement happens uh, uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, one thing that I have learned in my long service in the Senate is that legislation is the art of the possible. So long as you are able, as one is able, uh, the most important thing is that we are able to push the policies uh, that we believe is good for the country uh, as a collegial body. Uh, and that is why I am looking for a way by which we can come to an agreement uh, without uh, insisting on each other's view. Uh, we uh, are proposing a system wherein we maintain the integrity of the institution because policy issues are kept intact and not subject to uh, line item veto and the, and the uh, other aspect which is uh, which involves uh, the national internal revenue code can in, can also be presented and and uh, indeed accepted as a revenue measure that uh, that uh, would uh, authorize a line item veto uh, that's why, Mr. President, uh, may we know uh, why this proposition that we have cannot be accepted? Is it the theory, is, is it the position of uh, the good uh, sponsor that uh, the Senate should be decapitated, that it cannot uh, put in its own policy decisions as a collegial body in a measure uh, that uh, because it is, it can be subjected to a uh, line item veto authority of the president. I, I will not accept that, Mr. President. That is why I am trying to look for a solution wherein the views of the good uh, sponsor can be accommodated, and also the contrary view can be accommodated without causing any prejudice to the objective of the mission. That's all that we are submitting. Mr. President, otherwise, uh, you know, we, we, we will keep on debating on this issue and, you know, in, 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 we, there, there is no, we, are, we have our own mandates and therefore uh, can, in, can, can debate on our points of view. And that is why uh, we are proposing a solution which will not prejudice uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, points or the uh, purpose that the bill uh, would want to achieve, but at the same time, preserve the dignity of the Senate by protecting its right to, uh, to, to formulate policies which will not be subjected to cherry picking and, uh, uh, and line item veto 
by the executive branch so that only the policies of the executive branch can find its way in our statute books. That is our submission, uh, Mr. President. We are not trying to do anything except to preserve the integrity of the Senate by not allowing a line item veto to be exercised on a matter which is not a revenue measure, and that is the, the, the uh, rationalization of fiscal incentive. We are proposing that we split this bill into two so that we can uh, we can uh, we, we can tackle it together, but not in the same bill. Mr. President, I believe that um, his honor said we can keep debating. I don't believe we have to keep debating because I have made this representation has made her position clear. His honor has also made his position clear. So at this point, I believe that we do have a disagreement because um, this pos the position that this representation takes, as I said, I started the interpolation by already not knowing what his, his honor's question would be. I started by saying that tax incentives are technically tax exemptions, and therefore they are revenue measures. Not knowing that his honor's question would be in that direction, I established that early on in the discussion, and I'm just being consistent with my answer. Um, the country is bleeding, bleeding revenues that otherwise would be collected. And putting in the stopgap measures, which are basically this time-bound, target-based, um, performance-based incentives, is a revenue measure, Mr. President. And that is what this honor, this representation stands by. So that is the point of disagreement. Um, it is because those incentives are similar to, or if not, are actually tax exemptions, then they are revenue measures, Mr. President. And uh, yeah. for that reason, um, whether they were separated or not, that is the position that this honor would be taking in the context of how this honor appreciated the bill from the time it was put in my lap, Mr. President. And the, I, I think I've, I've uh, explained my position and I believe that there is that point of disagreement. But like I said, um, I always have an open mind. Um, but where I'm coming from at this point, at this point, is simply that the lowering of the corporate income tax was a decision that the economic team led by DOF was able to make, knowing that they will rationalize the incentives. And so with the drop of revenues, there will be an uptake on um, on uh, revenues over time. Again, to be consistent with my answer earlier to the to the Senate Minority Floor Leader, not immediately as other um, investors make it appear, because the earliest that they would even be affected would be four years from now. And in fact, if you would, if we were to look at the um, interpolation mm. that uh, the Senate President Pro Temp started with on the first day. He showed a um, a uh, chart that showed the effect of the drop in corporate income tax over 10 years. And then he aligned it with the increase on tax collection because of the rationalized incentives. So clearly, Mr. President, to this humble mind, and I do not pretend to be anything more than trying to be logical, those were both tax revenues, because why would we then be comparing them if they were not tax revenue related, Mr. President? So that Mr. Is Mr. President, with the indulgence of the to, of the sponsor and the minority leader, of with course, the indulgence. Anytime, anytime, yes, please. Yes, no problem, yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, with the, thank you to my brad and sis. Uh, I just like to, uh, I don't know if it's worth anything at this, I just like to weigh in because the train law was mentioned. I don't know if it helps the discussion on the one subject uh, rule and uh, on the veto power, etc. I don't know if it really will help. But I just want to share that the train law was uh, a kind of an amalgam of uh, of different provisions in different laws. Uh, you had the individual income tax uh, uh, reform. Then you also had things like 
uh, the syntax reform, and then you had the repeal of some VAT exemptions, which were found in not in the tax code, but in special laws. So I just wanted to share that. And we even had the um, amendment of some presidential decrees, because uh, I remember that was the on the coal, the coal, we raised the taxes on coal, coal products. So uh, yun lang. I don't know if that helps, but uh, uh, just to show that uh, I guess uh, um, in a measure, there can be se several uh, subjects, but uh, whether or not it's the body's desire to kind of separate it, that's a different issue. No, I just wanted to to share that if it's any help, uh, Mr. President. Yes. Um, uh, the, we, we, we concede the point that the matter of uh, several subjects in one bill has been uh, interpreted liberally by the court. What we are raising is if, if this bill, because of that situation, is considered a revenue measure, then the president can cherry pick and uh, 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 exercise the line item veto over policies which he does not agree with. Um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. That's my point. Thank you. I just uh, wanted so, to share. Uh, that's all. That's all, Your Honor, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you to the two. Yeah. Thank you to the two distinguished legislators. Sorry, before Senator Recto, can I have a group photo with my brads? <laughs> Rangara and Senator Gillon, uh, Beltan and Sen and uh, Sigma Rowan on the light <laughs> side. <laughs> no, please, please. Um, I think Senator. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, Senator Angara. Um, I have something to say, but let's let our Senate President uh, pro temp. Um, pres Senate President, can can we call on him? All right, the Senate President pro temp, Senator Director is recognized. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Now, I just wanted to also comment, uh, maybe it will be of help as well. Uh, uh, I remember the debates uh, during the train, and uh, many were actually some of our amendments. And my recollection is that we amended everything in the tax code. Mm -hmm. All of them were in the tax code. Yes. Um, yes. Oh. Uh, even the PDs were in the tax code. That is my recollection. So thank you very much. Yes. So, yes, uh, uh, Mr. President, <clears throat> we, we have no problems about amendments in the tax code. But the portion on the rationalization of fiscal incentive are not amendments to the tax code. They are new measures being inserted into the tax code, which, which differentiates it from the train bill. But even that, even that, Mr. President, what our only reason why we are uh, raising this issue is, I uh, repeat, the, the, the position of the, of the uh, sponsor that this is a revenue measure and I repeat uh, to the point of, uh, of being redundant, uh, the, the power of the president becomes uh, so broad because uh, of the authority of a line item veto in a revenue measure. That is why we are offering a compromise. Let us split the bill, and I cannot commit for the others, but I can assure the good sponsor that we will support uh, the two measures, and if we, if, if the sponsor uh, uh, will consider, we will take up first the rationalization of fiscal incentive, and then afterwards the reduction of the corporate income tax to assure the object that the objectives of the Department of Finance is achieved, which is to rationalize the fiscal incentive, and and as a carrot and stick approach we will reduce the corporate income tax. That's all that we are offering in our humble view, uh, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you for that. The offer of the Senate Minority Leader is very clear. Um, but I would also just like to make a response now to uh, the input of Senator Angara and then um, uh, also the input of Senator Recto. Um, we note no, and we thank Senator Angara for pointing out uh, the various um, provisions that were amended or were were introduced in uh, the train law, uh, including excise tax on sweetened beverage, excise tax on petroleum products, and so on and so forth, all excise tax. And then we provided for fuel marking, and then we required a tax incentive report. This is not an amendment to, to any incentive law, but it's a requirement on incentive. So I am just using this as an example to bolster my point that 
in my understanding of incentives, it is a tax exemption. So it's very much related. We're giving up taxes. We're not asking them to pay the taxes. So it's very much related. It's the other side of the coin of charging taxes. On the what the general rule is, you charge a tax and people pay a tax. And the exemptions are, well, as we provided, the exemptions are incentives. Now, under the train, the um, changed um, personal and additional exemptions, similar to tax incentives, they were withdrawn. So this humble representation does not see how the two, uh, the, the lowering of the corporate income tax and these provisions on incentives are not intertwined actually not even vaguely related but definitely intertwined and in the opinion that um as, as this representation said we have opinions from our um senate parliamentary council our senate legal council and from the senate um tax research office tax research study office mm -hmm. and um in one of those opinions it says that <clears throat> It may be argued that adding new sections to the NIRC on fiscal incentives in order to adopt a comprehensive approach in taxation of corporations will necessarily entail the amendment or repeal of numerous laws on these incentives. Even if the amendments or repeals of the laws are not expressed in the title of the measure, it is believed that they are all allied and germane i repeat they are all allied and germane to the purpose of the bill and are reasonably necessary for the accomplishment of the general objectives of the law which is the reduction of corporate income tax rates and the rationalization of fiscal incentives simply put the reduction of corporate income tax rates and the limitation or reduction on the grant of fiscal incentives including the amendment or repeal of the laws which originally granted these incentives are all related or germane to the general subject of taxation, Mr. President. So we have, we have opinions that um, support that, that they come from different laws. And as his honor, uh, Senator Angara, the chair of the <laughs> Committee on Finance and then chair of the Committee on Ways and Means uh, stated, this has been done. And I can also mention other laws amended by train, the Philippine Sports Commission, uh, the PTV Charter, Postal Service Act, New Central Bank Act, HDMF Law, OWA Act, Philippine Fisheries Code, Seed Industry Development Act, and GCP Law, so on and so forth. So, um, my dear colleagues, um, this is your chair, this is my opinion, and like I told the Senate Minority Floor Leader, of course, we can always continue to discuss this. It's a difference of opinion that we have, but I hope I have adequately explained because that is all I can do. All I can do is explain my position that tax incentives affect tax revenues because you exempted them from paying taxes and therefore it is very much related and I do not see any problem for those, for these um, provisions to all be in one bill. And we have opinions from various Senate offices, but it's a house because of course the original bill that came to us was a house bill. We also have their opinion um, supporting this, Mr. President. I submit. Yes, just a final point, uh, Mr. President. Our parliamentary practice would also support the proposition that in so far as the consideration of the incentives are concerned, uh, we do not consider them as revenue measures that must originate from the House. I'll cite a specific example. The Freeport, the authority of the Freeport area of Bataan, or AFAB. This was a Senate bill and, and passed on, passed as a Senate bill, and not considered as a revenue measure which must originate from the House. And in our reference of business in the Senate, the view is that the incentives is not a revenue measure which is referred to the Committee on Ways and Means, but is referred to the Committee on Trade and Commerce. So these are parliamentary practices which indicates the opinion of, of the leadership that these are not revenue measures that must originate from the House. Because I go back to my original proposition. I do not want to weaken the Senate. 
by uh, making it uh, uh, inutile insofar as policy issues are concerned, because whatever policies we propose in a non-revenue generation measure can be subject to the line item veto. And, and in order to preserve the integrity of the institution, but at the same time, preserve the objectives of, uh, the, uh, of, of the CREATE bill, we are proposing that this, we split this into two and uh, uh, so that the issue of a line item veto will ca can be resolved without sacrificing the principles that the good sponsor is espousing and the legal uh, the, the le and the views that uh, the legal principles that both of us are, are are defending. Thank you, Mr. President. I would just like to add to um to the wealth of information that have has been passing back and forth here. And again, I. I express my appreciation for the minority floor leader and for all those who are participating no, and to help us understand this better. Um, in terms of Senate jurisdiction, the jurisdiction of, the, of your Committee on Ways and Means, paragraph 5, section 13, rule 10 of the Senate rules on jurisdiction of the committee says, all matters relating to revenue generally, taxes and fees, tariffs, loans, and other sources and forms of revenues. So unless we will now say that... Uh, uh, our committee on rules made a mistake in the referral to the committee on ways and means. Um, the fact that it was referred here as is uh, substantiates that um, initial position, uh, which which is then further substantiated by the opinions that this honor has obtained specific to create and consistent with jurisprudence of the Philippines that these subject matters on lowering of corporate income tax and rationalization of incentives, as I said, is tantamount to a revenue measure. It is a revenue measure because rationalizing incentives will either bring you more revenues or reduce your revenues. I, I don't think anyone can argue with that, Mr. President. That's what it is. Where, what, what else are these tax incentives? They either increase your revenues or they decrease your revenue. So it is not wrong to bring it to the Committee on Ways and Means, and to have it in one bill, Mr. President. We submit. Oh, that is not wrong. We are saying that, oh, I agree with you, it is not wrong. But is it correct that you give the President the power to exercise a line item veto over a non-revenue measure? When you grant a tax and incentive you are taking away that 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 entity's duty to pay the tax you are saying you are exempted you will not pay because of this special uh -huh. rate we are giving you or no rate so therefore mr president like this this just the presentation has been saying in my humble mind it makes logical sense that it is because it it will either reduce the revenue collections of the country or it, it will increase it. And that is what we are talking now about in this time, that it is much needed revenue. And that is why it is included in the package, Mr. President. Uh, that is beside the point. What I'm just saying is, are we giving the president that carte blanche authority to exercise a line item veto over a non-revenue, over a measure which uh, uh, governs the incentives, which in our history in our parliamentary practice uh, was never considered a revenue measure, which is subject to the line item veto authority of the president. That's what I'm saying. That's what I am emphasizing. We are trying to protect the prerogatives of the Congress, which will be eroded with the grant of a line item veto over what is not, what is clearly a non-revenue measure. That's our point. Thank you, Mr. President. This representation understands the point that his honor is making. However, we stand by the position that it is a revenue measure. The, the incentives, I, I do not know how else I can clearly state it. Granting of incentives reduces the revenue collection. Therefore, it affects revenue. Therefore, it is a revenue measure. Now, taken separately, I do not I do not question that it would go to a different committee but as it is 
it is properly in the Committee on Ways and Means and properly in the same bill that is before us right now. I, I think we've said our pieces. So unless the gentleman would still like to say more, I think we can agree that we disagree on this point. And I am very happy to discuss this in caucus and further because I really don't have anything more to say, Mr. President, because the position I take is that the granting of incentives is a revenue measure because it is taking away the revenue that will otherwise be collected by this government. And therefore, under our constitution, yes, the president has that ability, has that power. I am not granting him any more powers than is already granted in the constitution. Thank you. Well, okay, uh, Madam Chair, uh, and with the concurrence of the leadership, uh, can we discuss this in caucus? I don't, I don't mind. Yeah. I don't mind at all, Mr. President. I don't mind at all. I, I've, I've offered to, but can we proceed with the other issues? Because clearly there would be a couple of issues that I, in fact, was going to um, try to summarize and ask if we would like to go into caucus. But I was going to do that later on. Can we continue so that we can terminate, no? as we had hoped to be able to terminate the period of interpolation today, Mr. President? Well, we'll try, but we have no guarantees. Uh, that no, we I... Can... I Definitely, yeah. I do not. Um, I will not insist on anyone. Um, to I will not rush anyone. I am just making myself available to answer the questions during this period of interpolation. Okay, uh, uh, Mr. President, can we uh, uh, go to section two hundred ninety-one? In so far as uh, 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 two hundred ninety-one, <clears throat> the. Uh, uh, the the uh, uh, provision states scope and coverage. This title shall cover all existing investment promotion agencies as defined in this code or related laws and all other investment promotion agencies and similar authorities that may be created by law in the future. Uh, Mr. President, pending before this chamber, are a number of uh, measures uh, which would uh, uh, which could which uh, could be considered as an IPA and uh, which is uh, whose creation is provided in the proposed measures. These are Senate Bill Number One Five Four Nine, which will create the Regional Investment and Infrastructure Coordinating Hub of Central Luzon or the Ritz Bill, Senate Bill 1788, the Ilocos Norte Special Economic Zone, Senate Bill 133, uh, and uh, about four other measures which will provide for incentives, uh, Senate Bill 538, which will provide incentives for the manufacture, assembly, conversion, importation of green vehicles, which provide for a nine-year excise tax and duties exemption, a Senate Bill 1382, the Electric Vehicles and Charging Stations Act, uh, which exempts uh, electric vehicles, uh, uh, the uh, Senate Bill number 889, the revival of the Philippine movie industry, which provides uh, for uh, 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 a 5% uh, gross income uh, gross income earned uh, tax and the Senate Bill 6 or 5 or are not granting tax incentives to broadcast and print media. Uh, the way to, uh, what will happen to these bills the moment we pass uh, this measure uh, containing uh, Section 291? Which, uh, which says that it shall govern, uh, that the, it shall apply to uh, similar, uh, to uh, IPAs and similar authorities that will be created by law in the future. Mr. President, um, the objective of CREATE is definitely to capture all IPAs, even those that will be created in the future. Otherwise, then we do not achieve our goal of rationalizing the grant of incentives. If these IPAs will come up with their own, 
then um, this will be a failure. And uh, I submit to the body um, how we intend to go about it if, if there are contrary views, because really the objective is that all IPAs would be captured by this uh, CREATE bill, Mr. President. So it will be controlling on all future legislation. This provision, too, particularly 291, because of the provision 291, uh, all future legislation must conform to the uh, principles under the CREATE bill. Is that what we are made to understand, uh, Madam Sponsor? Well, Mr. Princip uh, Mr. Mr. President, we have, stat we have principles of statutory construction. We have rules on statutory construction. Uh, that a special law um, takes takes uh, precedent. I mean, has has more weight over a general law. We also have a rule on statutory construction that the latter, the the latest rule would also govern. And we also have a pr a principle on harmonization. So our objective really here is to harmonize. Of course, we would like to. We would, in fact, this representation when we when we we participate in the interpolations. Usually, our goal is, aside from a specific uh, issue that we address, is really to ensure there are less questions left to uh, the implementers and uh, even for the judges, Mr. President. So, uh, I'm stating the objective, which is for the IPAs to be covered by this rule. So, of course, if there will be a future legislation wherein we say it will not be covered, then it, it will not be covered because the latest legis legislation would govern. But I can still state that principle because that is intended to be the principle. In fact, um, I will end up going to the majority floor leader every time a bill comes up to make sure that that policy <coughs> is made clear, unless the body decides to exempt it. And unless there is a super, I mean, a, 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 a serious reason to exempt it, the, the, the general objective is for them to be part of this whole system so that we can rationalize incentives, Mr. President. Uh, yes, uh, so Mr. President, uh, the uh, good sponsor will interpret uh, Section 291 as controlling for all future legislation which will create IPAs. In so far as they're having to be fall under uh, the FIRB and the CREATE law, but perhaps that would be amendments that we will seek to make depend when we start reviewing the bills to lessen the chances of confusion or uh, um, yeah, to, to lessen the chances of confusion. We, we, perhaps that might be a, a uh, amendment we will insist on making for all the future bills that will be um, um, sponsored on the floor, Mr. President. Again, simply as the chair of this Senate's Committee on Ways and Means for consistency in this uh, general law governing IPAs that we are we are debating now and intending to pass. Uh, okay, is the good sponsor saying that uh, 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 Section two nine one cannot be amended by future law, or uh, that no exceptions can be created by future legislation? Oh, we never, we never said we never said that, Mr. President. In effect, in effect, Mr. President, when the good sponsor said that uh, yes, they are bound by the principles uh, as in the uh, in, in this bill, uh, and citing uh, section, and we are citing section two nine one, which says that it is binding upon IPAs and similar authorities that may be created by law in the future. It only uh, me. It only to me, to us. Uh, it connotes uh, an irreparable law. In other words, we cannot repeal or amend this particular provision. Mr. President, His Honor, his honor knows. Mr. President, His Honor knows that uh, there's no such thing. No, the uh, uh, as I, uh, except for the chart, except for our constitution, any law here can be amended. Um, I think there that we have sufficient laws in our uh, in past in the history of the Philippines that are intended to be the general laws, and then there would be subsequently subsequent laws that, unless there are specific provisions uh, repealing or or amending uh, the general law, um, then the general law would still be the governing law, and that's where a lot of confusion comes out, and that's why we have a whole book and uh, and library of. Uh, 
of uh, rules of statutory construction. And therefore, I'm spreading it into the record that this is meant to be the general law governing IPAs. And for future IPAs, the intention is that for them to be governed by this law unless we carve out something else for them. That is, that is the uh, sole prerogative of Congress. If they want to carve something out, then they can carve something out. But I am simply spreading into the record that the objective for CREATE is for it to be the general. I, I guess I would say it's similar to, um, uh, for lack of a better example, what I can think of is the NIPAS law. This is the law um, governing the creation of protected areas. After we passed that law, we still had to pass a number uh, for every area that we wanted to protect. It, we had to pass their individual laws, but the NIPAS law still had the general provisions on what the characteristics of a protected area would be. But um, each law that we passed, whether we were protecting a mountain or uh, a diving area, landscape, seascape, would have some details. And ideally, it would harmonize with the general law. Um, ideally, we crafted it well enough that there are no conflicts. And that's why we're saying this is the general law. It is intended to govern all IPAs unless specifically carved out. Hopefully, we clear that enough that there are no debates on this in the future. And I'm very happy to accept amendments that would prevent confusion in the future. So would the, the good sponsor accept an amendment which will delete the phrase and all other investment promotion agencies and similar authorities that may be created by law in the future? Not really, Mr. President, because that is the policy that this this bill uh, is really intending to create. And like I said, the future bills can carve out. We we are we we know that we passed this law, and therefore, if there's a future bill that we intend not to be included, then we should specifically carve it out because the objective, as I have explained, and as I assume our colleagues understand is that this will govern all the IPAs. If anything yes. will be carved out, then that should be carved uh, out in the future. Yes. To, again, to prevent confusion. Yes, precisely to prevent confusion, I am proposing that we delete this phrase and all other investment promotion agencies and civil authorities that may be created by law in the future. Because when we create uh, another IPA in the future, we can expressly say that the powers of that investment promotion agency is subject to <coughs> Section 291 of the uh, of the NIRC. In other words, what we're saying is, uh, uh, since it is conceded that we cannot bind future legislation, we might as well uh, delete this particular amendment and just be conscious that in the future, when we create another independent investment promotion agency, we just make it clear that they shall be covered by this proposed uh, uh, investment uh, promotion uh, agency or, or, or the FIRB under this uh, bill. Is, is, that problem, is that a problem to the good sponsor? Yes, Mr. President. Unfortunately, it is a problem because we know statutory construction and we know that future that, that um, the latest law will govern. So if we do not clarify this and we know we Mr. President, let's not um, let let's be candid about this. No, uh, it, it every every legislator who would want to push for a measure would try to push for the best, the best, the best, uh, whatever provisions they would want to put in there. And I do not fault them for that. But being the author and the sponsor of this measure, it would be my duty to sort of be the guard, no? to, to police um, the provisions, because the objective is wala namang lamangan, just because matagal na, na yung, matagal nang pinasa yung mga ibang IPAs, they would be um, governed by by less favorable terms. That that is not meant to be the objective. So therefore, I have to be clear that this <coughs> is the governing law, and that is why we cannot accept that kind of um, amendment, Mr. President, at the yes. at the proper time. No, but I'm already explaining the yes. reason for that because otherwise we would be bound by statutory 
uh, construction provisions that said the latest law governs and that the special law governs. Eh, di bali wala na huto. And it's similar to what I would say. Hindi po, hindi po bali wala. With all due respect, hindi po bali wala. It only it governs all the IPAs that that are existing as of the time the law becomes effective. Yes. Yes, but we Mr. cannot Bethlehem. bind. We cannot yes. bind future legislation. But that that is how I feel strongly that it is not intended to be a disadvantage to those that are existing now. So, Mr. President, all I'm saying is the reverse of what His Honor is saying. If there's an intention, and if the body agrees to carve out a future IPA, then carve it out. But the law should be clear that this is meant to govern all IPAs. If we no. pass later on a new one that we want to carve out, then that is the one we should carve out. Yes. That is the position of the of your chair, yes. Mr. President. The other way of putting it is if we want this law to apply to that IPA which we'll create in the future, then we should state so. Mr. President, and we are stating it here and now, Mr. President. Otherwise, yes. you are stating on, something represent which will make this law uh, irreparable, which is contrary to all concepts no, of legislation. Then you cannot take a law irrepealable because this is Mr. not the Constitution. Mr. President, then, Mr. President, I never, I, I, the very first question His Honor asked if it is the intention for this not to be repealable, and I already stated the answer. I said, of course not. So please mm -hmm. do not say that because that is not what I said and that is not well, what I have been saying. It, we are very amenable to changing the language that says subject to to amendments uh, amendments made in other laws, whatever. But I, we are open. I, I am always open, but I am establishing the fact that this is the general law. And unless an IPA is carved out, let's not be confused. By by, let us be assured that we are all clear that this is the general law. That is all I'm saying, Mr. President. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, the principles of statutory construction uh, would indeed uh, be invoked in favor of this uh, of, of this not being binding upon future congresses. If a future congress will create. Uh, an IPA were saying that the IPA should automatically uh, be governed by this uh, bill that we are debating on now. I cannot accept that. That's uh, totally contrary to, to, to principles of legislation. Uh, we are binding future Congress. We are telling them, hey, Mr. Future Congress, you cannot pass a law which uh, would uh, uh, remove the jurisdiction uh, of of an of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, investment promotion agency from the classes of the FIRB. That's all I'm saying. That's the principle that we are trying to protect also, that uh, uh, the principle that you cannot enact a repealable laws which uh, is being uh, enacted by Section uh, 291. That's all that we're saying. Mr. President, the future laws may always repeal, may always repeal this this bill or amend it in any way. So to make it clear, there is no intention to make this irrepealable. It is just meant to be the governing law until otherwise repealed or clearly amended. We know that there is usually a lot of debates and uh, it even it goes to court on whether it was the intention to repeal, the intention to amend. So unless otherwise amended or repealed, this is the governing law. By all means, any Congress, even this very same Congress, can repeal it the very next day, if that is the intention, Mr. President. I am simply saying that the, the principle of equality also requires that, in general, all the IPAs would be governed by this law. If the Congress decides, no, we are making a super IPA, by all means, I am always open. I am just making it clear it's not, that... It's not that being, yes, yes uh, Mr. President, it's not being open. And I'm not referring to the good sponsor on a personal basis. It's not, it's not, the, it's not the will of any, of any member of Congress to say, it's, you know, uh, if that is the, 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 the principle that we, are, that we are fighting for here, is that you cannot bind future legislation. So that is the principle that uh, we are we would want to emphasize. And that is why we do not see any basis for the 
for Section 291 on that portion, which says that uh, uh, it, that this uh, that this uh, create bill is uh, uh, binding upon uh, future legislation, uh, Mr. President. And I guess there's a clear difference of opinion between uh, the good sponsor and this representation. Well, not really, because we both agree that there is no such thing as an irrepealable law. So, so we, if that is we, the agreement, so if that's the agreement, why don't we delete this particular portion? Mr. President, I've already said it. The reason we not is because I want to make clear that this is the prevailing law. And if there is the intention to repeal it, then it should be stated in the next law. So there is no confusion. That's all I'm saying. That is where we have the difference. His okay. owner does not want to put that burden in the future laws, which I feel will lessen all the uncertainties if, if, that, if that simple provision would be put there, which is what we tried to do here in the CREATE bill. We took pains, and it is also why um, it took weeks before we were able to release even the original CITIRA bill, because I had to review what was being repealed, what was being amended. It's a tedious process, Mr. President, but that is what is required if you have a bill of this magnitude. Anyway, we submit, Mr. President. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, we similarly submit our differing views on the matter. <clears throat> Can we now go to section 296? Uh, this is uh, the, uh, um, the, the uh, and let me read it. I'm sorry, section 297. Uh, this is the expanded functions of the FIRB. Uh, let me read it to, so that we get the context and the, uh, uh, the and, and our under, my understanding correctly of this of this particular provision. It says, the, uh, Section 287, the functions and powers of the FIRB under PD 776 as amended shall be expanded as follows. Letter B, to approve or disapprove the grant of tax incentives to the extent register, uh, to, the, to the registered project or activity upon the recommendation of the IPA. Now, in this particular case, the, uh, I, uh, the, uh, the, the, the IPA would only be recommendatory and could no longer grant the incentive. Is that correct, ma'am? Sorry, Mr. President, what's the question? I, I, you were reading it and I didn't know that you shifted to a question. What was the question? Yes, I was, I was reading it up to the first part of, of, of letter B, 297. Okay. It says uh, the power yes. of the FIRB is to approve or disapprove the grant of tax incentives to the extent of the registered project or activity upon the recommendation of the investment promotion agency. Yes. Look yes. at it for a while. Uh, this means that uh, my understanding is that the, uh, the uh, IPA becomes a merely a recommendatory uh, agency. Is, is that a correct understanding? The answer is yes. However, um, the FIRB may also delegate that power to the okay, IPA good. itself. Now, uh, yes, the FIRB may delegate that power. The law grants the power to grant incentives to the FIRB. And we're saying under section 11, paragraph B, that the FIRB can delegate that delegated authority. Is that how we understand it, uh, Mr. President? The FIRB can delegate that delegated authority. Yes, Mr. President. Is the gentle lady aware that there is a prohibition against uh, a delegation of a delegated authority? Mr. President, um, I am aware that there is a general policy on that. Um, however, uh, it is our view that because the IPAs um, have already been exercising this function, and really the FIRB is almost like a, um, how do I put it? Um, Um, because the, the FIRB will simply approve or disapprove based on the recommendation made by that IPA, then it was this uh, it was our position that 
that that could still be delegated, Mr. President, precisely because of the um, concern of many IPAs that were brought to our attention that they have already been performing this function and they are equipped <clears throat> and able to do so. So really, the objective here was really for FIRB to to just be the you know to give that official sign off on it um, because of their need to be. Uh, to ensure that uh, the the investors are compliant, so that is our position, Mr. President. But but we understand the concern. Uh, 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 Mr. President, is the good sponsor aware of, of the principle that when you delegate that first it prohi prohi that prohibits the delegation of a delegated authority, that's one. Number two, that in any delegation of legislative authority, there must be standards uh, uh, for the exercise of that legislative power so that what is left to the, uh, the agency is merely an execution of a declared policy. So my question is, what are the standards uh, for the uh, that must be followed when uh, the the delegate the delegated authority is exercised, I do not see anything in the law, uh, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, we are aware of the need to comply with a valid delegation, and the law does provide for these standards. Um, the standards are based on the. Uh, well, Supreme Court rulings that the, the job to be done must be described, uh, who would execute it, and the scope of that authority. And therefore, um, we have included a specific uh, wording in the bill that would address this. And if I may pull out uh, the bill, the copy, the, the provision, so we can point this out. Yes, Mr. President. yes please. please, yes. Okay, here, here we are. It, are we in the same section? Section. So we are on section 297, what page? Page 26. It's actually um to, uh, maybe, yeah. Does this honor have a copy, the lined copy? Uh, it's page 26 and it starts on line 13. <coughs> so Hold we on. Inserted... Yeah, I'll, I'll look at my copy. It's a few lines below letter B. I mean, it's part of letter B. It, it's towards the latter can we have, the, can we have the page, uh, ma'am? What page? Uh, what page? 26. It's actually the same provision, the same paragraph that his honor read. Ah, uh, okay. And it's where is it? A few lines down. Mm -hmm. Starting with taking into consideration. That okay. Part. So I can read it, Mr. President, yes, uh, for the benefit of the others. This was precisely this representation's insertion here to mm. address the need for a valid delegation. And this is taking into consideration factors such as, but not limited to, level or location of investment, type of activity, and fiscal risk. So this is the provision that says that uh, the FIRB may delegate the grant of tax incentives to the technical committee um, or the investment promotion agency. So now identify, we identify who, who will it be delegated to? These are the, these are the two. And mm -hmm. then um, what is, what is the, what, what is going to be delegated? Uh, we'll take into consideration the following, uh, the factors that we mentioned. <clears throat> uh, um, um, Mr. President, uh... With, with the indulgence of the good sponsor, can we continue our interpretation next Monday? We have been here already for uh, two hours, more than two hours. So can we request a <clears throat> continuation until Monday, Mr. President? Mr. President, may we ask for his, may we ask his honor how many more questions or... Uh, Just one more session now. Well, at, at, because at the most two, but at, at, at not more than uh, two. Just, uh, just 
We can try to finish it on Monday, uh, Mr. President. Because, Mr. President, um, I, I, I simply ask for consideration. My staff was exposed. We all had to take a test thanks, thanks to the imposition of the uh, Senate Medical that uh, uh, we, we take a test to, to check. And everybody will go home. We get exposed again to a certain extent. As you can see, despite our best efforts, we have to look, we have to share notes, we have to look. I am talking about the health of these people. And unfortunately, I am also incapable of doing it without staff support. Um, the various agencies are with us. We try to be safe by putting a acrylic barrier. And that's why I appealed to all. I, I, again, I, um, I don't want to impose. I think you all know me well enough. I don't impose, but I simply ask for consideration because every time we step out, there, there is some degree of exposure, uh, as you can see. And, uh, and then we will go back on Monday, on Tuesday, and Wednesday. And again, it is not my intention to rush anyone. We are here in the Senate. Um, the, the Senate president is uh, so kindly, patiently waiting. Um, but if there's any way we can try to move it forward, Mr. President, I know that many of you will be submitting amendments. I don't expect it to be easy. I take on this task. Um, gladly, but I ask for consideration because um, we also are on timelines, COVID aside, exposure aside, we agreed that we would finish this next week. And I am worried that um, to start the period of interpolation on Tuesday, I do not know if I can give you a clean copy on Wednesday. How would we pass it then, um, dear colleagues? I leave it up to you. If you tell me that we will not pass it, I do my job by making myself available. I'm just standing by what I, I thought that we agreed that, that we would try to finish this today. Um, Our agreement, Mr. President, is that we will pass this and it is a certified measure by Wednesday next week. And I'm um, abiding by that uh, deadline. Yes, but Mr. President, I was kindly asking for consideration given that we are working in the time of COVID, we are constantly exposed. I am worried that we will be rushing these amendments. You know me, I will try to give in to the amendments. We will be in close contact every minute despite our best efforts. And so I wanted more time. I wanted to be able to look at the amendments this weekend, not all, but for those who can submit, yes. and then those who want to deliver on the floor on Monday so that we can have a clean copy for Tuesday. If I, I cannot promise, it's a very thick measure, Mr. President. Uh, yeah. How do we pass it if, if, if yeah. all of our colleagues will ask for a clean copy on Wednesday and we're not ready with it, Mr. President? So I'm just being practical. Well, we submit, uh, Mr. President, uh, to, the, uh, to, to the ruling of the chair. We committed um, that we will pass this, that uh, we will vote on this by Wednesday next week and we will not... We, we are committed to that deadline, and we are just saying that if possible, uh, we call it a day, uh, but if the chair rules that we'll continue, we have no choice but to continue because we have a commitment, uh, Mr. President. Mr. President. Majority Leader, what do you say? <laughs> the, the question was addressed to the chair, Mr. President. <laughs> Um, well, um, I had to go upstairs, Mr. President, hey, because uh, I had a bathroom break. I'm sorry. Session is uh, suspended.
Thank you, Mr. President. Not, I believe there's uh, a compromise that uh, you're trying to propose. Yes, uh, not that uh, um, we are we do not uh, um, accept the proposals, but um, if uh, the minority leader is um, who has been on the, on deck for almost three hours, but again also the sponsor is um, is here for almost three hours with the staff, and they're both. Uh, uh, the positions are correct. If the major minority leader would uh, want to suspend, what I can um, propose is that uh, we resume on Monday at 2 o'clock and allow the minority leader to finish his uh, interpolation and go into the period of amendments thereafter. If uh, that is um, acceptable to the minority leader and the sponsor, uh, <coughs> we will um, suspend the session until 2 o'clock in the afternoon of Monday. Um, perhaps uh, the minority leader uh, would take up another two hours. Uh, not not two days, two hours. <laughs> I am not Senator Rexpo, Mr. President. Huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, by 4 o'clock. Uh, we're already talking about the, the amendments and then um, hopefully some of our colleagues who are uh, really uh, concerned about the, uh, the, the certain provisions of the bill that um, they submit the amendments ahead. You know, some, some may be able to submit ahead and of course some I know would uh, want to do it on the floor and uh, be able to discuss it with the sponsor. So. If that's acceptable to the body, um, uh, yes, I will um, I will state the ruling. Mr. President, before you do that, um, there's also a request from our sponsor that uh, if we could have a caucus prior to the two o'clock session, so maybe we could have a 1 p.m. caucus and then the session at two. Right. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Yes. Um, we can do that as requested. Um, we will call for a all senators caucus at one o'clock. Yes, sir. Resume the session or uh, call the session to order at two o'clock. Yes, sir. Continue with the period of uh, interpolation of uh, the minority leader, and uh, hopefully in uh, two hours, a couple of hours, uh, we are going already into the period of minutes. Therefore, by the e evening of Monday, we, uh, we probably would be able to take up about fifty percent of the amendments. And um, at the worst, at very at the at, at the worst, Tuesday will, will be the the end of all the period of amendments, and uh, we still have Wednesday to to go. So, yes, Mr. Uh, President, I totally agree with you, Mr. President. All right. So sure. there is no objection. Uh, Mr. President, I believe yes. Senator Delon would like to be recognized. The minority leader is recognized. Well, the majority leader already agreed, so we have no choice. <laughs> no, sir. I always sure. listen to the wisdom of our minority <laughs> floor leader, but uh, no, is it uh, time to relax and to study? Kidding aside, yes, we have no problems. Uh, kidding aside, uh, we have no problems with the timetable set by the good Senate president. When we'll abide by it. All right. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, the, the sponsor uh, uh, would be willing to... Um, uh, accept the amendments ahead, you know, so that they can study it already and it will yes, be easier. It's, there's also our sponsors are requesting our colleagues if they have amendments that they're already ready with mm. uh, and uh, are willing to submit to her earlier. All right. Yes, Mr. President, if I may add, I, I'm just thinking that some amendments, you know, would be very specific and uh, we can easily work through that with DOF. Um, and then others might have different ideas on handling things that those would be the ones that I would need more time and then I can bring it up already in focus that there are different opinions on this or that. Like I said, I, I, uh, I simply am trying to see this through. So I'm just asking for support in uh, be, being able to, to collate all those concerns and, and present it all back to you in an orderly fashion, Mr. President. All right, Mr. President. Uh, yes, so in the Mr. request of the, the, uh, yes. do you have something? Senator Jolon, Mr. President, I'd like to be recognized. Senator Jolon, 
Yes, uh, this early, I am already uh, would like to submit to the good sponsor my amendment, which would split the bill into two. If they can con that. consider that. One uh, which uh, is on uh, uh, rationalization of fiscal incentive. The other one is on amendments to the NIRC on the corporate income tax. Uh, uh, and we are saying that uh, we can tackle this uh, simultaneously, but separate bills. Uh, that's my amendment that we are uh, submitting. Right. Requested by our colleagues. Therefore, we declare that uh, we will have a call at 1 p.m. on Monday. We will convene the session at 2 o'clock, continue with the interpolation of the minority leader, and um, in a couple of hours, um, uh, the period of amendments will be open. Thank you. Um, Mr. And President, then we can also, discuss all these. Mr. President, before, thank you. Um, we completely agree with you, Mr. President. Uh, but before I suspend consideration of the measure, may I ask the good sponsor, I only have one amendment. I'm not going to, I never interpolated. I just have one amendment that's actually bringing down the sale of shares. Yes, we, talked, we discussed yeah, that. From 15% to 10%. At least I just want to put that on record. It's my only amendment. And I, I heard the good uh, uh, Secretary of Finance, even in our hearing, uh, he mentioned that he's all right, all right with it. Although they have a, they sent me an undersecretary to discuss uh, mm. the of why we should, it should remain. But um, for the record, Mr. President, with all the businesses closing down now, <laughs> There are bigger businesses like the Big Brother that want to take over certain businesses so that the people still remain at work and, and they can still continue to try ability. It's very difficult to do. It's so, the taxes to sell the shares are so high. So maybe we're appealing to the DOF uh, to allow us the uh, bringing it back to the original. Before train, Mr. President, it was 10%. So after train, again, 15%. Baka pwede lang natin may baba ulit ng 10%, um, Mr. President. Yeah. So that's my, my, uh, my uh, submission, Mr. Yes, President. Mr. President, um, if, if you have a few minutes later, DOF is here, and I think they, they have an explanation to you on that. So if, if you have time to... I, I actually got the explanation to the actor secretary. It's not very... Ah, you didn't, it's it not convincing not, It enough. was not convincing you. Okay. Yeah, not... I haven't had the time. I don't know if I was CC'd, so I can take uh, a look at it. Naman, Mr. Yeah. President. But I, I remember you staff, explained eh? it to me in principle, and I I, I understood yeah. it. I, I just haven't discussed it with them, no. So let me let me also check with them on that. But I understand his honor's concern. Thank you very much, Mr. President. So um, of course I don't want it line item vetoed. That's why I'd like to discuss it also with yes. the DOF. But and I, I can't there was a commitment from Secretary of Finance, Secretary Dominguez, that he was all right with it, even in a TV interview, yeah. even meeting with the Chamber of Commerce. And also during our hearing, I had asked him about it. And he said, yeah, that's not a problem. You know, as long as you rationalize the fiscal incentives. I'm well, <coughs> Mr. Uh, so, Mr. President, the, yes, the majority leader, done. yes, the majority leader uh, precisely uh, expressed the apprehension that his amendment, sana hindi malign item veto. Okay, we sir. do not need that kind of apprehension if it is not as a revenue measure. That is why I am saying I want to protect the integrity of the legislature because to consider this as a revenue measure will precisely expose the, uh, the uh, proposed amendment of the good majority leader to uh, the threat of a line item veto and similar situations in the other amendments and parts of this bill. That's all that we're saying, Mr. Mr. President. President. We're not saying we're not objecting. We're not objecting to the measure. We're just saying that as a matter of policy, we should not allow the executive branch to exercise a line item veto on measures which are not revenue measures per se. That's the principle that we're trying to push, and we have uh, expounded on that. On Did you get uh, that? What? I think so. What's that? What's that, Mr. Gordon? Gordon, sir. Senator Gordon. I just want to make sure I understood the uh, statement of the minority lord leader. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I apologize. Uh, you know, 
we can uh, we can do the the Senate, the Senate Secretariat can study the possibility of doing what they have in the House. Muting the other members. They can mute. They can mute anybody. <laughs> you know? uh, we, 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 let's study that so that uh, you can mute these guys who are uh, opening their microphones when they're talking to, your, uh, to the, somebody. Their stuff. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, that's the, uh, Mr. Yeah. President. Mr. President, that is the dream of your majority leader. To have his <laughs> no, to the vice. Mr. President. <laughs> yeah. Mr. President, the concern of the minority leader is noted. Uh, please, as I said, uh, we noted. And for those items that we disagree with, I'm happy to discuss it in caucus. We will only have an hour, though. So uh, I, I would request that those who have issues that you think are, you know, major, Feel free to just let my my me know. You can direct it with your staff so that we can put it in the agenda. If there are ten items, then that only gives us five minutes per item, you know. But at least we can agree that okay, these are issues that we will postpone maybe for another caucus. And just very briefly, in response to his honor, uh, the amendment of uh, the majority floor leader is a tax amendment. So it is really like that. That's why I believe his honor said he would rather it be clarified because it is really subject under the constitution to align veto. So we don't want that to happen, but there's nothing we can do about it because I mean, there's nothing we can do about it if if we cannot get them to agree with us. Just to clarify the minority floor leader's statement that we are trying to we don't we want to remedy it. We cannot remedy it if um. Uh, no. Because it is, that, that particular item is a tax is a tax item. If it's, it's a clearly, if it's clearly a revenue measure, I have no problem with that. Yes, that yes, a light yes, item veto yes. exercise. I have yes, no problem yes, with that, yes, Mr. President. President. That's why I'm just clarifying that uh, my, my majority floor leader's amendment is a tax. That's why he knows that it will be subject unless we can get them on board with us, which is our goal. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. So, majority leader. Uh, Mr. President, um, we move to suspend consideration of uh, 1357, Mr. President. All right. Any objection? Hearing none, consideration is suspended. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I'd just like to put on record, uh, I forgot to mention earlier, uh, the co-authorships on Senate Bill number 1844, this is the emergency powers on ease of doing business for the mm -hmm. President. Several of our colleagues this, uh, had uh, uh, asked us to be uh, asked the Senate to be co-authors as well. Senator Bong Revilla, for the record. Mm -hmm. Senator Lito Lapid. Senator Bato De La Rosa. Um, and I believe also those who are listening now, I believe ought to be co-authors. Senator Richard Gordon, he co-sponsored uh, the measure earlier as well. And uh, Senator Sani Angara, Senator Winga Chalian, Senator Joel Villanueva, Senator Nancy Binay, Senator Grace, who I think also would like to uh, be made a co -author. All right, we place that on record. Earlier, we mentioned already the, the others Some who names. are uh, made uh, co-authors and co-sponsors. So, for the record, also, Mr. President, I'm making an appeal since the DOF is here. I see Secretary uh, Under Secretary Tony Lamino. Yeah, um, maybe we can discuss that particular issue after this uh, session, uh, Mr. President. I'll, I'll ask uh, them for to to discuss it with the uh, with your uh, your study. So, with that, Mr. President, we move. Again, a reminder to everyone, we have a caucus at 1 p.m. on Monday, and then we start session on 2, 2 p.m., sir. Mm, yes. The secretary will uh, send notice. Yes. Senator Gaetano. I just want to invite you all to um, see you in the DOH hearing uh, on Friday at 1, 1 p.m. Um, I will be chairing it, and you are all welcome. Please bring your food, your snacks, your merienda, because it will be a long day. Uh, Department, <clears throat> Department of Health. Unfortunately, uh, I would want to attend, but unfortunately, um, I prefer to discuss the budget of the DOH in plenary. That's my favorite department. <laughs> it's your prerogative, Mr. President. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for With due respect to the sponsor, of course. No problem, Mr. President. All right, so, majority leader. Thank you, Mr. President. We suspend or suspend time? Adjourn. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that uh, we adjourn session until 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Monday, October 12, 2020. I so move. All right, any objection? Hearing none, the session is adjourned until 2 o'clock in the afternoon of Monday, October 12, 2020. Go here.